Corinthians um, currently stand at 30 uh, prophets and elders and a few others. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Durham, North Carolina, the Bull City. Welcome to uh, the City Council work session for this, the fifth day of May 2020 uh, at 1 p.m. here in our City Hall Plaza and first floor council chambers. We want to welcome those of you who are here with us today in person, as well as those who are joining us remotely. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor O'Neill. I am here. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. I'm here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Williams. Present. Thank you. Thank you. I will now turn to our colleagues, my colleagues, to see if we have any announcements for today. Mayor Pro Tem, followed by uh, Councilwoman Caballero. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, and to my honorable colleagues and to all in the chamber today and those watching uh, from wherever you may be uh, remotely. Uh, happy uh, Thursday to everyone. Madam Mayor, I just wanted to, to briefly acknowledge that this is uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Month uh, in our country, and we certainly want to celebrate uh, the incredible achievements and accomplishments that members of those communities here that are part of the Durham fabric uh, contribute to our city daily uh, and weekly. So I did not want the opportunity to go by uh, without acknowledging it officially from this day, it's on record, uh, and let uh, those folk, those members of our community here in Durham, uh, that represent uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander community, that we are so grateful uh, for the contributions they make to the rich and diverse mosaic that is Durham and indeed our nation. So happy AAPI month to all of our beloved Durham residents and citizens. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for that, and we will certainly echo those sentiments. Uh, we value all of our members. That's what makes us a great city, that we are diverse, and we value everybody. So thank you all for your many contributions to Durham. I will recognize Councilwoman Caballero for her announcement. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. I just, again, want to remind everyone that we are in early voting until May 14th. I will probably be announcing it every single meeting we have until the primary, which is on May 17th. You can early, you can register and vote uh, during early voting. You do not have to. Um, not sure what's going on with my mic. I apologize. Oh, it's my phone. Got it. Um, and the primary is on May, oh, good Lord. Anyway, you can't register to vote on voting day, so that's my reminder for folks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Without the voters out there, we would not be in these seats today, so we remind you of, of that important uh, civic, civic responsibility. Councilman Williams. Yes, I failed to mention uh, recently, hold on, Council Member Johnson, you mind if we move this thing again? <laughs> We, we have this thing where it is, it's in our way over here. Uh, I failed to mention last time about the League of Municipalities. Uh, significant news. The city of Durham received an award, and kudos to our just amazing staff and leadership for making this happen. Um, we received the award of Most Entre Entrepreneurial Town Award, uh, uh, city of Durham with the town of Louisville. So as far as large cities, we received that award. Uh, and I uh, was recognized at the past conference. And this is based on honoring municipalities that in the face of financial challenges, completed a project or an initiative without the utilization of federal or state dollars. And a winning initiative, Innovate Durham uh, initiative, which was uh, reward, uh, recognized. So just wanted to state that on the public record. Thank you, Councilman Williams. And uh, as usual, we show out when we show up. All right, are there any further announcements? 
We will now turn to our priority items by our city manager, Paige. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor O'Neill, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and members of the Durham City Council. I do have several priority items for you, and I will walk through them at this time. Agenda item number six, JFK Towers, JFK Towers, North Carolina, TCLP, Development Loan Commitment. The administration is requesting that you suspend the rules today to allow the city to provide the required letter of commitment so that the developer can close on permanent financing and secure a current interest rate. Agenda item number seven, the administration is also requesting that you suspend the rules today uh, on this item and it is Cedar Terrace Apartments, Taft Mills Group, LLC, Development Loan Commitment. By suspending the rules today the, at this work session, it will allow the administration to provide the developer of this project with the required letter of commitment for their final tax credit application, which has a due date of May 15th, 2022. Additionally, we have item number five, which is an interlocal agreement renewal for Durham City County Strategic Youth Initiatives. We are asking for a 25 minute time slot to make a presentation along with this item. Agenda item number 12, proposed water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2022, 2023. We have a 15 minute presentation uh, for this item. Agenda item number 20 is the fiscal year 2022-2023 proposed budget and fiscal year 2023 through 28 capital improvement plan, our CIP. A presentation will be made on this item at the May 16th, 2022 city council meeting. And finally, agenda item number 22, fiscal 2023 stormwater rates. We do have a presentation for this item and a public hearing on this item will be conducted during the May 16th, 2022 City Council meeting. That is all I have this afternoon. Thank you, City Manager Page. You have now heard the City Manager's priority items. I am ready to entertain a motion for their approval. So moved. Second. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Freeman and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem uh, that we approve the manager's uh, priority items. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. We will now turn to our city attorney for her priority items. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and members of the City Council. It's good to see you today. I do have one priority item today. I would request that the City Council hold a closed session at the conclusion of all regular business at the end of today's work session. Uh, we can hold the motion until we get to that point of the meeting. But I do ask for that closed session, please. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I recognize uh, we are now ready to entertain a motion to accept the City uh, Attorney's priority items. So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Councilwoman, uh, Councilman Williams and seconded by Councilwoman Johnson to accept her priority items. Uh, we will now uh, ask that we vote. Uh, all those in favor, sign by saying aye. 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 All those opposed have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. And then we will entertain your motion to close session at the end. Is right. that what you were Okay. All right. Let us briefly now return back to the request by our city manager to suspend the rules for items. Item six, JFK Towers, JFK Towers NC, TC, LP Development Loan Commitment. Uh, number seven, Cedar Trace Apartments, Taft Mills Group, LLC Development Loan Commitment. 
and I am ready to enter. Madam Mayor, I move that we uh, suspend the rules to vote on items six and seven. Second. Second. It, it has been moved by Councilman uh, Williams and seconded by Councilwoman Johnson that we suspend the rules. Uh, we are now ready to vote. All those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. 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 All those opposed have the same right. I oppose. Please note that we have one in opposition, uh, and the ayes have it. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve, that we authorize the city manager to issue JFK Towers and CTC LP or its designated affiliate, approved by the city, a conditional binding commitment of permanent financing in an amount of up to $1.5 million in affordable housing bond funds for the rehabilitation of 177 affordable rental units at 4900 Old Farm Road in Durham, known as JFK Towers. Is there a second to that motion? Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilman Williams at this point in time. I'd ask for all those in favor, if you would sign by saying aye. 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 All those opposed have the same right. I oppose. We have one up in opposition, uh, Councilwoman Freeman. The ayes have it. Madam Attorney, do we need to vote on each motion? Yes, I would. Okay. Um, I move that we authorize the city manager to execute any and all documents and instruments necessary, reasonable, and appropriate in order to carry out the purpose and intent of this conditional binding commitment of permanent financing. There a second. second. It's been moved by Council Williams and seconded by, I'm sorry, moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilman Williams. Uh, at this time, I'd ask for those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. 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 All those opponents have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it. I move we authorize the city manager to make necessary and sundry changes to the conditional binding commitment of permanent financing so long as the changes do not increase the financial obligations of the city and the changes taken as a whole are not less favorable to the city. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilman Williams. Uh, we are now ready to vote. All those in favor, would you say aye? Aye. aye? aye. All those opposed have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. I move that we approve item seven to authorize the city manager to issue to Taft Mills Group LLC or its designated affiliate approved by the city a conditional binding commitment of permanent financing in an amount up to $6.9 million in affordable housing bond funds and or home investment partnership funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the development of 180 affordable rental units at 3400 Carr Road in Durham known as Cedar Trace. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilman Johnson, um, Councilman Williams. Uh, all those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. 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 All those opposed will have the same right. I oppose. We have one in opposition, Councilwoman uh, Freeman. Uh, the ayes have it. I move we authorize the city manager to execute any and all documents and instruments necessary, reasonable, and appropriate in order to carry out the purpose and intent of this conditional binding commitment of permanent financing. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilman Williams. All those uh, in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. aye. All those opposed have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. I move we authorize the city manager to make necessary and sundry changes to the conditional binding commitment of permanent financing and associated documents so long as the changes do not increase the financial obligations of the city and the changes taken as a whole are not less favorable to the city. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman uh, Johnson and seconded by Councilman Williams. All those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. aye. All those in the opposition have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. All right. We will now turn to our city clerk for any priority items that she may have. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and council members. Uh, I would like to pull item number four, and I'll read that item. It's the nominate and appoint a city of Durham resident to fill one vacancy on the at-large seat of council. I'd like to pull that for discussion and to suspend the rules in order to vote. All right, 
Now I would entertain a motion to accept our city clerk's priority items. So moved. Second. Second. It has been moved by Mayor Pro Tim Middleton and seconded by Council <laughs> Freeman. Uh, would we all sign, all those in favor, sign by saying aye. 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 All those in the opposition have the same right. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I'm ready to entertain a motion to suspend the rules in accordance to our, our request by our city clerk. Move to suspend. Second. It has been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and seconded by Councilwoman Freeman. All those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. 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 All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. We will first read our agenda through and then we will come back to our pooled item by our city clerk all right so we are uh, going to read our administrative consent items item number one the durham bicycle bicycle and pedestrian advisory commission appointment item two the durham historic preservation commission appointment item three the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee appointment. Item four, which has been pulled, is to nominate and appoint a city of Durham resident to fill one, one vacancy on the at-large seat of council. We now turn to our departmental items. Item five, the interlocal agreement renewal for Durham City County Strategic Youth Initiatives. Item six, which we have already dealt with is JFK Towers, JFK Towers NCTC LP Development Loan Commitment. We've already also uh, uh, resolved and uh, disposed uh, item seven, which is Cedar Trace Apartments Taft Mills Group LLC Development Loan Commitment. Item eight, contract with Dixie Lawn Service Incorporated for right-of-way mowing and litter removal services. Madam Mayor, would you pull that item, please? Yes, sir. Item nine, the second amendment to contract number 17430, supplemental agreement number two with Kimley Horn and Associates, the Durham County Transit Plan. Madam Mayor, can you pull that item? You would like that item pulled? Yes. Okay. Item 10, the 2022 through 2025 transportation on-call contract number 18920, supplemental service agreement number one, US 70 access and connectivity service study, I'm sorry. Item 11, the award of a service contract to Taylor Meter Technologies for the large meter inspection and testing services project. Madam Mayor, would you pull number 11 for me, please? We will. Item 12, the proposed water and sewer rates for FY 2022 through 2023. Item 13, contract agreement for services with Made in Durham. Item 14, fiscal year 2022 through 23, agreement to fund economic development programs, programs and services operated by Downtown Durham Inc. using City of Durham funds. Madam Mayor, I don't want to pull it, but I did want to say on the record I'm really appreciative of the work that this organization has done, and um, thanks for weathering through the pandemic and looking forward to more coming. Madam Mayor, I didn't want to pull it as well, so I was just going to hold it, but um, because Councilmember Williams mentioned, I do want to say that I think that the services that are provided in our downtown area are exceptional, and I think we have to figure out a way to make sure that the 
more of the underserved businesses in our community actually have that type of service as well. That's all. Thank you, and we thank uh, Ms. Nicole Thompson, who is here with us in in the uh, city chambers this afternoon. Thank you for all that you're doing. Item 15, the National League of Cities Hispanic, I can never say this word, Entrepreneurs Pilot Program Grant Award and Grant Project Ordinance. Madam Mayor, I don't want to pull it, but I was just really happy to see this and I want to thank uh, OEWD for working really hard uh, to, to organize around this. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I didn't want to pull it, but I would hope that OEWD will work to acquire more than 15,000 um, to make sure that this is successful. I Thank concur. You. Thank you so much. Item 16, contract amendment for ST-317C utility locate services. Item 17, contract SW-86 Public Works Street Maintenance Repairs 2022. Item 18, Street and Infrastructure Acceptances. Madam Mayor, can you pull that item? That was Councilwoman Freeman. Yeah. All right. Item 19, SW-89C Project Management and Inspection Services. Item 20, which is under our presentations, fiscal year 2022 through 2023, proposed budget and fiscal year 2023 through 2028, capital improvement plan, CIP. A presentation will be made at the May 16, 2022 city council meeting. Public hearings, item 21, the consolidated annexation Andrew Avenue Apartments. Item 22, this FY 2023 storm water rates. And there will be a hearing on, a public hearing on May 16, 2022. That will conclude our agenda. Madam Manager, here's what I have for the pooled items. Items four, item number four, item number five, item number eight, item number nine, item 11, item 18, 12. item 12, item 18, and item 22. Are we in agreement? Yes, ma'am, that's what we have. Now, I do not see any citizen matters, just to make sure, great. All right, now I am going to turn it over uh, to our Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Middleton, and Councilwoman Johnson, who have headed our legislative uh, committee uh, to return back to the priority item from our city clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And again, good afternoon to you and to all of my honorable colleagues and to those of you in the chamber uh, and those watching at home. We come now to uh, deal with the matter that our clerk, and I want to thank our clerk for the work she's done in, in uh, quarterbacking this selection process uh, for us. Uh, as chair of, of, of the procedure committee, I want to thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for your uh, insistence on transparency, uh, your insistence on public uh, participation as well, uh, and for us to be uh, deliberate uh, in really this most uh, sacred uh, choice, perhaps second to the budget that we passed for the city. This might be one of the most um, significant um, and serious uh, choices that we make and decisions we make as a council. Um, it's, a, it's an inferior process, and when I, when I say inferior, secondary to an election, uh, in that these seats are the property of the people of Durham. But every once in a while, in filling these seats, the responsibility, the sacred responsibility, falls to us, and we're called to act as surrogates in place of the almost 300,000 people of this city. That's not to be taken lightly. Uh, it's to be approached with the utmost seriousness, um, utmost sobriety, 
uh, and utmost respect uh, for the fact that we are acting as surrogates for the people. Uh, the best way to fill these seats is through election, but uh, as circumstance has played, uh, this, this uh, option uh, and this responsibility falls to us legally uh, and morally as a council. Uh, as chair of the, of the uh, procedures committee, I want to thank uh, my co-chair, uh, Jillian Johnson, who has been uh, wonderful uh, in this process and making sure that we've honored uh, standing customs and practices and, and traditions of the council when it comes to when these times uh, fall to us to fill these seats. And I want to thank her. She's been a great partner in this process. As chair, uh, it falls to me to, to start the, the discussion and either the honor or the burden of, of casting the first vote and starting the conversation uh, belongs to me. I guess history will determine what, what that is, but it, it's an honor uh, to start this conversation. Madam Mayor and colleagues, we are blessed in Durham. We have an embarrassment uh, of riches when it comes to people uh, that are civically minded, uh, that love our city, uh, that are possessed of our values, that are animated by the spirit uh, that makes Durham such a special city uh, in this country. And that has been really, really um, illustrated in this election process. Um, first, with the 20-some-odd folk who uh, initially put their names in a hat, and we want to honor them on behalf of a grateful city for their willingness to step up and serve on what sometimes is a thankless, a hard job, but it is incredibly rewarding. Uh, and then the final four who are with us uh, in the chamber today, uh, each of you have profound, profound gratitude and respect not only from this council, but from every resident uh, of this city, every citizen of this city. Um, this is perhaps one of the most impressive group of people uh, I've had the honor and privilege of considering. Uh, it was humbling reading uh, through their accomplishments, through their credentials, and I, I particularly was moved uh, on, on Tuesday night uh, when we had uh, folk for each of, of the four candidates come and speak so passionately, so convincingly, uh, not just about their, their accomplishments and, and their, their vitae, but, but them as people, as human beings. And I, I my belief and, and love for this city uh, and belief that we have the absolute best people in this country living in Durham was reaffirmed uh, during that conversation. But lo, alas, it, it comes down to having uh, to choose one. Uh, and Madam Mayor, in, in my uh, deliberation process, one of the things that guided me was, was what would deepen our debate and our considerations as a council. But I also considered what we have available to us as a council when it comes to our staff as well. Um, not just our experiences and expertise on this podium, but what our staff brings us as well. Uh, and they bring us a lot, a great deal of expertise, a great deal of insight. Uh, and when we ask the right questions, when we provide the, the appropriate runways and on-ramps, uh, our conversation is deepened greatly by the staff. So in considering what staff brings to us, our professional staff and what we have up here, my question was what would uh, deepen, what perspective um, are we not exposed to either through each other or through our incredible staff uh, on a regular basis? Uh, and that's what, what brought me to my decision. I want to say uh, to Dr. Price, Dr. Hallman, Dr. McCoy, and to Nate Baker, we would win with either one of you. Uh, and the solace I take in having to only choose one person today is that to a person, each one of them uh, committed that they would be interested in, in seeking to serve this city moving forward. Uh, I find comfort in that because either one of them sitting up here would add incredible depth uh, and incredible uh, reach uh, and, and another aspect to this council. But after uh, consideration, uh, deep dives and listening uh, to what the people have had to say and, and again looking at the makeup of this council and looking at uh, what is available to us via staff, I'll be casting a vote today for Dr. Monique Hol uh, Holman Holsey Hyman uh, to fill uh, the at-large uh, vacancy seat. I think that her perspective uh, from her work as a social worker, um, from what I heard from the members of the community who spoke on her behalf, uh, would be a welcome uh, and deepening, um, a deepening addition. And by deepening, I mean providing a perspective uh, that I think oftentimes uh, goes uh, not covered in some of the debates we have. Uh, we've got a lot of policy wonks at our disposal as a council. Uh, we've got a lot of lawyers. Uh, we've got a lot of folk 
um, who have worked on policing and other issues. Uh, but I personally uh, am intrigued by having our debate challenged and shaped uh, by someone who has been in human services and, and, and particularly uh, with her social work background. So I am be casting my vote for Dr. Hyman today uh, to fill uh, the at-large uh, vacancy left by our good friend, Councilmember Charlie Reese. I think it would, would honor his service and commitment. Uh, I think it would set us up for success moving forward. Uh, and I look forward uh, to the other three candidates, uh, if, if my candidate should, should um, win the day today. I look forward to the other candidates uh, continuing their engagement in our public square and deepening the life of our city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're going to proceed down the, the podium. Her, her honor will go last. Uh, so I'll yield at this time to Councilmember Freeman. I would pass. Thank you. What do you mean pass? Are you not? Okay. Councilmember Caballero. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I think the part that was very uh, amazing about our process, at least for me, was Tuesday night. I think all four applicants, the supporters that they brought, the commitment and dedication that they have shown Durham, and that was very evident by all of the folks who came and spoke uh, from them, for them. We have a lot of talent in this city. We should be very, very proud of that talent. Um, every single applicant was extremely strong. Every single applicant uh, was very genuine and thoughtful and caring. This is not an easy process. Uh, after reading applications, I thought maybe I had somebody that I was leaning towards, and then interviews, maybe somebody else, and then after Tuesday evening, I was even more flummoxed. Um, but I will be casting my vote for Dr. Monique Holsey-Hyman. Um, I think the part that really, I think, challenged me was that we definitely don't have that perspective on council and then also very much her passion for youth and mentorship. We need it. Uh, we know that we're struggling uh, with our youth in the city for many, many reasons. And I look forward uh, to being a colleague to her and also to help her because I've been in this spot. Uh, the fire hose is definitely in your face for several months. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, position to be in when you are appointed. Uh, because you do not seek election. You have not been for three or four months running a campaign, preparing potentially. I want to thank every single applicant who applied. I know Durham has a very, very bright future because you are here with us. I hope that you do seek higher office. We, will, um, we have elections every year in Durham, North Carolina. There are many, many seats. Uh, so thank you again for applying. Thank you to your supporters who came and spoke on your behalf. Uh, thanks. That's all. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Council Member Caballero. I'll yield at this time now to Council Member Williams. Thank you. Uh, yes, this this is a pretty tough moment. Uh, I had to be drugged to vote on this because I did not want to. Uh, I think I was on public record just a little over a year ago um, when I was in, you know, the position of trying to seek an appointment. And the first statement I said was, I wish this was just taken up in an election, you know. Um, and up until the very last minute, you know, before today's meeting, um, I gave in to the pressure of our reality. And, you know, this city has a capacity of seven seats to um, be at the top of the food chain and running the city. And I struggled with so many things uh, leading up to this point, simply because, one, we, I was so appreciative to have so many people willing to make such a sacrifice to serve in this, uh, in this capacity. But down to the four, uh, the final four, um, one, I did not know as well, but I was extremely impressed with what they had to provide um, one, I, two, I've sought advisement myself from, and uh, another I've engaged with and just in the community, and, you know, just in general, and have been extremely impressed. Um, and I will, I will admit, I, I came into this with my biases, and I, you know, 
I have my interests, and then I have my, you know, just time spent. And I could not come up with a decision. And I said I wanted to just not take on this pressure and lead it to an election, let it go to an election. However, pressure is a daily reality that we have to um, face in this capacity. And um, it's something you can't run from. And you don't always make the right decision, but you make your best decision. And that is how you sleep at night. Uh, and while I clung on, while I was clinging on to my biases, you know, the, the folks that I was like, you know, this, this person is extremely smart, but so are the rest as well. All of the things that I was factoring, I thought about taking, my, I had to take myself out of it. I had to take myself, what I would prefer out of it. And I had to think about what, you know, what are we missing? I think uh, just listening, some others did the same process. What are we missing? You know, what do we have, you know, as a city government? You know, what do we have as a council in regards to expertise? But most of all, what does the community need in this moment in time? And while it can sometimes be a burden that we have an election every single year, it's also a good thing we have an election every single year because we can always have the opportunity to refresh. Uh, so while each of the candidates, uh, I have a great deal of respect for you. Um, and even just being honest, going against what my, my personal bias would be, uh, I am going to go with who I think can address the need of our community right now. And that's building a whole person. That is building a whole person. Uh, from the interviews to the applications to the speakers, um, and just reflecting on all of that, uh, I too am going to go with Dr. Monique Mosey um, Jose Harmon. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. At this time, I'll yield to Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I want to echo my colleagues' appreciation for everyone who has taken part in this process, especially the applicants. Um, we were really blessed to have a fabulous group of people applying for this role, and especially the four finalists. We absolutely could not go wrong with any of the four of you. Um, this is the third time I've done this appointment process, and um, it's never easy. There's always a lot of really, um, a lot of really fabulous candidates who are who are excited about about serving our city, and we are so fortunate to have to have so many um, civically minded and, and politically engaged people in our community who are excited about, um, about serving our residents. Um, I'm also going to be casting my vote for Dr. Monique Colsey-Hyman uh, for a couple of reasons. I am really excited about her um, expertise in social work, which is something that um, we, you know, that we that we don't have right now amongst um, amongst our body, and is something that I think is really important to bring to the table now that we are, um, especially in in our consideration of different ways to provide community safety. We are relying a lot on people um, in the human services field, social workers and um, and other mental health workers to to really change, um, make some, some big changes in our, in our safety systems. And, and I think having that expertise on the council um, will, be, will be really valuable for us. Um, I also just wanna mention, I was really touched by the first speaker um, for Dr. Holsey Hyman at our, at, our Tuesday, um, at our Tuesday public comment, the, the, way, that she, um, the way that she described her, her leadership and mentorship um, was just really, really inspiring and, and touching for me. And my mom was a social worker, so I also have just a lot of respect for, um, for the profession and, and think that it's, um, it'll be a great a skill set to add, um, to add to our body. Um, again, I want to appreciate everybody who applied. You all have amazing skill sets and knowledge and um, a real heart for our city. And I hope that you'll all continue to stay involved in um, in the work for the city that you're doing now or in other, um, in other projects in the future and look forward to, um, to continuing to work with, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Madam Clerk, before I yield to her honor, the mayor who will have the last word, uh, Council Member Freeman has indicated that she's already made her vote known to you. Would you report that for the record, please? 
Absolutely, Councilmember Freeman has voted in favor of Dr. Monique Colsey Hyman. Thank you. Her Honor the Mayor. Good afternoon, uh, Bull City and Durham, North Carolina, and to our candidates uh, who applied for this process. As you know, for Councilman Williams and I, this was our first time uh, being a part of this process. And first of all, I'd like to thank our leaders who have guided us through this process, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and Councilwoman Johnson, who have uh, worked really hard uh, in, in front in the public eye as well as behind the public eye to make sure that this process has gone well. I'd also note that our uh, city clerk and all of our staff, our county manager and uh, um, our county attorney, you know, they make sure that these uh, processes go well. For me, as, as your newly elected mayor, in my consideration um, of how I would uh, go about uh, casting a vote, it was really important for me, one, as a person, um, to make sure that I was being true to what I had promised the citizens of Durham as a mayor, was also to consider um, our council um, and how we could build a more, co more cohesive uh, group knowing that democracy does require um, differences. But there are some things and some places where I believe that is it important that we have agreement. And then the third is to the accountability to the people who elected all of us and how we stand in the place of them uh, for this particular juncture. So for me personally, you've heard me say it over and over again from the very beginning of my quest for this, boots on the ground, leave no one behind. And there has to be a place where folk who have traditionally been left out are included. For me as the council, the things that have been important to uh, all of us, primarily violence and community safety. We all want a safe Durham. We all want to address violence. And we all want to figure out how we can get into the space to, to really get some expertise in their area. And thirdly, to the citizens at large, which is pretty much what they've all told all of us, how do we begin to address some of the deep-seated issues that have plagued our city in terms of some of our most marginalized communities? And so I, too, will be casting my vote for Dr. Monique Posley hyman because I think she can provide for us a mechanism for boots on the ground. She can provide leadership that will help us leave no one behind. We have an ability to, as my Mayor Pro Tem has said, to kind of learn some of the other things. And, and we appreciate all of the knowledge. But on this one, this particular at this particular time, for such a time as this, I think that we do need a person who can provide the deep dive into humans and their behavior and how to address it. So I thank you all for applying. We look forward to her joining us up here on this dais. And I hope that you all will continue to be civic-minded and continue to be engaged. So thank you all. And congratulations to you, Dr. Hosley Hyman. You have received a unanimous vote of the council. That counts for yeah. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a couple more 
uh, responsibility to, dis to discharge as chair of the procedure committee. By my assessment, uh, Dr. Monique Halsey-Hyman has received the, un the unanimous vote of the council and, and is now council member designee, uh, Dr. Monique Halsey-Hyman. Um, just a, a word about, Madam Clerk, how we will proceed in onboarding uh, Dr. Hyman. Um, we will leave it to you to work with her and her family to identify a time between now and next week for her official swearing in. We want to give her opportunity to have any folk that she may want to have in addition to, I see her husband is in, hello, husband in the chamber, uh, in addition to any folks she may want to have there for a swearing in opportunity to also do some light onboarding uh, before she crosses the legal threshold of being sworn in uh, and having to sit up here. So she has our profound congratulations and our profound thanks and congratulations to all of the candidates as well. Uh, we are a better city because of each of you and I look forward to your continued engagement uh, in the public square. Uh, council member designee Hyman, congratulations, ma'am. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you. Um, it's gonna be a very short honeymoon period uh, because there's a lot going on in our city and these are challenging times. Uh, but we're confident that with your skill and your passion, we will be a better council and a better city. You have our profoundest congratulations and our support of each and every person on this dais. Congratulations to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll turn the gavel back over to you now, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a fine job. Thank you to you both and to you all for your uh, participation in this process. And now we will return to our pooled items. And we will begin with item number five, which is the Interlocal Agreement Renewal for Durham City County Strategic Youth Initiatives. And we will receive a presentation. Our resource person is Ms. Laura Khalil. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and council members and everyone dialed in. It is great to be here with you. And thank you for the space and time to hear our presentation. I'm Laura Khalil, uh, pronoun she, her. I'm the city county youth initiatives manager and I'm joined by another member of my team today who can introduce herself. Hey everyone, uh, glad to be here. My name is Elise Frazier. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the youth engagement manager for the city of Durham's office on youth. Okay, great. Let me see if I can figure out this technology. Um, all right, I think the slides are showing. So as you read in the meeting materials, we're here to talk about the city county interlocal agreement or ILA for youth initiatives, which is expiring at the end of June. We are here to make recommendations for a renewal of that ILA and also seeking your approval for it as well. And I also want to share that this past Monday, we presented to the Board of County Commissioners. They were supportive of the proposed ILA and they requested one small revision, which I will share later in the presentation. All right, let's see. Great. So this is how we plan to spend our time together. We'll start with a very brief refresh of the ILA backgrounds and share some highlights of our accomplishments over the last four years. We're gonna to try to squeeze that in to um, 10 minutes or less. And um, we have been giving updates throughout the years pretty regularly. So this is a high level view of the arc of our progress rather than specific project updates. Um, and then we'll share recommendations for the ILA renewal and have time for discussion. All right, let's get started. Okay, so we've used this slide and the next one in past presentations. Just wanted to do a quick refresh. Uh, the uh, ILA, the Youth Initiatives ILA began in 2017 when the city and county made a commitment to fund an initiative that could build on Durham's uh, past efforts to support youth success. So there have been a lot of work done and this is a continuation and a legacy of work to support young people. Both agencies entered into an ILA and that established a city county position that would lead the new initiative. And that is the position that I've had the honor of serving in for a little over four years. And that position is based on the office on youth in the city manager's office where uh, complimentary programming was already happening at the time. And over time, kind of the key takeaway here is that there were a lot of goals of the initiative um, and over time, we worked to fully integrate them 
as goals of the Office on Youth so that our efforts were in sync. So the initiative became a way to advance Office on Youth goals and vice versa. Oops. Okay, so this is an old visual we've used for a few years to show how the Office on Youth goals connect to the initiative. You can see the challenges um, that have been identified on the left, and then the manager's responsibilities intended to address those challenges, and then how all of those things come together to form the Office on Youth goals, which we'll be touching on a little bit later in the presentation. So what did we build in four years? Uh, we're excited to share with you our top five. Before we dive in, I did want to do a little context setting for what we're about to share. Um, our work focuses on long-term strategy. We have plenty of short-term impacts, that's for sure, um, as you'll see. And we're also building new pathways for those most affected by our community's pressing problems to have power in shaping solutions to those problems. Um, you might have heard of the saying, nothing for us without us, and that is a guiding principle for us. Um, and so what we're building in the office are ways or mechanisms for doing this that are scalable, and we like to think applicable beyond just youth initiatives, right? Beyond just young people. And we we believe that they have the potential to be really transformative for our agencies. So I'd ask that you hold that context as we share today. So what did we build? There was a drum roll, so I get it now. Um, I, I get to kick us off with number one. This is a foundation and a blueprint for the work. So being clear about our vision and how we will get there and how we will stay true to our values has been an anchoring practice for our office. We began our strategic planning process immediately with hundreds of meetings with lots of different types of stakeholders and it's been an iterative process ever since. Um, it has helped us focus, which has also helped us maximize our resources and our impact. Um, our process incorporated equitable community engagement uh, that allowed us to hear from hundreds of young people and their families and service providers. This is our youth listening project, which you're familiar with. Um, and they told us exactly where to focus. They gave us a very specific roadmap for how we can make Derma a better place for young people. And I just did want to highlight that that blueprint reflects the needs and dreams of black and brown youth LGBTQ youth, um, immigrant migrant youth, youth who are not working and not in school, and youth who have experienced economic hardships, houselessness, and interactions with law enforcement. And our work continues to center these and other often excluded identities. So we're happy to say that the, the Youth Listening Project report has been catalyzing a lot of really exciting things ever since. It's helped us direct uh, government dollars, thousands of government dollars to initiatives that are actually responsive to what young people said was needed. It's informed our work and has also been uplifted and informing the work of many of our partners locally and beyond. And so the last thing I'll say on this slide is none of this would be possible without our relationships. I'll say that again. None of this will be possible without our relationships and our partnerships and the trust that we have built and that we hope to continue building, that these are part of our foundation as well. So it seems only right to just share what all of this has yielded before we jump into our other highlights, just quickly to uplift our values and our vision and mission. This is what we're about. We believe that young people's voices are important and that they deserve to be part of the decisions that affect them and their communities, that they are key stakeholders and leaders in our community right now, and that we have to work intentionally to achieve equity so that all young people in Durham have what they need to thrive and to feel seen. So our work is really about creating spaces and structures for this to happen and doing it in partnership with young people and their families and other people who work with youth. So the two key strategies we use are youth engagement and collective action with stakeholders. This is, this, we believe these two strategies 
will get us to the outcomes that we want to see in Durham, ultimately leading to happy, safe, well young people who are celebrated and affirmed uh, in every direction of the dimension direction of their lives. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Elise. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, thanks. Um, so one of the second kind of areas that we really built out in the last four years has been equitable youth engagement. Um, Laura mentioned that a key strategy for how we do this is really about creating opportunities for young people to be leaders and decision makers within local government. Um, so we do this work in two ways, and we've talked about it before, but we work with service providers, so adults, in creating the spaces that are needed for equitable youth engagement to happen, right? We know that youth power does not happen inherently. It does not exist inherently. So those spaces have to be built. Um, and then on the flip side is that is that we work with young people to build up their skills, um, to connect them to opportunities, and all the play, all the things that they need in order to thrive in these new decision and leadership uh, roles. So a brief example of that would be our work with the comprehensive plans, plan uh, policy working groups. So first we connected with the planning department staff to allocate youth seats on the policy working groups. From there, we met with the adults and the young people um, who were recruited for the policy working groups to do a training and like, what does youth adult partnership look like and how do you build successful youth adult partnership? Um, and then after those trainings and the work began, we didn't just leave the young people we supported them throughout the process and their tenure on the policy working groups. We met with them regularly um, to help, like, how do we continue to strategize so that you can be most effective in this space? So that's some examples of how we do our work. Um, I have a couple of quotes that I want to share from some young people who were on the policy working groups. Uh, one young person says, uh, through this experience, I have learned how to communicate my opinions and thoughts in a group full of adults. This is the first time I've ever been in a space where my voice and opinions hold the same weight as those of my adult peers. Another young person says, I was able to have a voice and I finally felt important. I'll repeat that. <laughs> I finally felt important. Everyone was respectful and understanding. Um, so that's kind of examples of how we do our work. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what success therefore looks like for us. Um, so really it's a heightened awareness that young people are key constituents within Durham. And then it's also about more departments and organizations seeking us out for support in creating youth engagement and youth leadership because they really value and see the value of youth voice. And then this last piece of success is really about like high impact projects like the comprehensive plan, which I mentioned, and um, participatory budgeting, for example, creating new roles for young people to be decision makers. Um, I want to say that this can be like kind of hard to measure quantitatively, right? But we do have a couple of measures that you'll see on this slide. Um, so one is that we are tracking the number of new decision-making opportunities created for and filled by young people. You can see on this slide that we're now um, have over 50, oh, excuse me, now we have over 75. Uh, my dyslexia just popped out a little bit, so I was about to say 57. <laughs> um, but we now have over 75. Um, and our number is growing now that we have our youth ambassadors on board. I do also want to emphasize that this number looks different than our kind of like broader youth engagement, where we have engaged over thousands of young people. Um, we hope this 75 or this uh, 76 that we currently have um, will surpass 100 by next year. Um, the, the last measure I kind of want to mention that we use is we track the number of systems and structure changes um, that have allowed for like youth leadership and decision making to happen. 
So these are changes like new seats, new youth seats on boards and committees, but also new and revised operating procedures. So to date, we have um, over 25, like our work has led to over 25 new systems and structure changes. So this is 25 new ways of doing things within the organization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm actually, for time, the sake of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I'll just say that this is kind of an illustration highlighting our wins um, and the ways in which we built and supported youth leadership over the years. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the kind of third area that we've really been focusing on is how do we build provider networks for better alignment? Um, when Laura was speaking a moment ago, she talked about like two of the key strategies being one, youth engagement, but then also the other being collective action with stakeholders. So we often talk about better alignment um, and connection to service providers as a way to enhance our overall goal of enhancing youth services in Durham. So this looks like finding areas of natural alignment among providers, and then also convening and skill building around those areas. Um, so to date, we have done this work with over 100 organizations. Um, currently, our most effective mechanism for facilitating alignment is through our Durham Youth Leadership Fund. We talked about the fund, I believe we came and talked about it in August, so I won't talk a lot about it, but just kind of like an overview. I'll say through the fund, um, we are supporting 13 community organizations to advance the projects of, to advance the priorities of our youth listening project. Um, and we are really operating as a cohort with the Durham Leadership Fund grantees. So we meet regularly, we do some skill building with them, but we also incentivize them building and collaborating outside of us. Um, Laura mentioned that our processes are very scalable. And so I, we believe that this community grant mechanism is not only scalable, but it can be used for larger investments to bring about alignment amongst other youth priorities. Um, and then next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the fourth area is really about communication and connection to resources. So for us, communication and connection is not simply just about awareness, right? So we really think about it as like, how do we make youth services better fit the needs of young people and also more relevant to the needs of young people in Durham? Um, we had to start with a deep understanding of what those needs and barriers were. And as Laura mentioned, we got this through the Youth Listening Project. I'm not going to talk about the Youth Listening Project a lot today because we've talked about it previously, but what I will say is that one thing that we heard from young people is not simply that they do not know about resources, but sometimes the communication of those offerings are a barrier in and of itself, and we recognize that service providers don't always have the time or the marketing skills necessary to really do this effectively. So we see in our office that we have a role to play um, in addressing these challenges. So you'll see that we are requesting a new information and communications position. And this person will really dedicate the time needed to really work through um, creating solutions and expanding our impact here. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the rest of this slide, but I will mention that we have our Yield Durham text line, which is a way for us to send resources directly to young people in the community. Um, so as opposed to young people having to seek out resources, we send them one-way text messages. We also have our Instagram page and we have our uh, Yo Durham listserv, which has over uh, 300 service providers to date. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I think that's all that I wanna share about this. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And finally, I just kind of want to talk about our own 
internal capacity and infrastructure building, we have been focusing on building our own capacity as an office to really not only do our work, but also support other departments and organizations in building their youth leadership. Um, so you'll see that we've done this in a lot of ways, but one thing I wanna highlight is because of some additional funding and support from the city, we were able to um, hold leasing space at the W.G. Pearson Center. Uh, this has been vital to our work because the center is really a hub for youth serving organizations and has really broadened our partnerships and our networks and access to organizations outside of the city and county. And then the other piece, um, this additional support was able to allow us to have our youth ambassador program. Um, I'll say that we've done a lot with a relatively small budget. Um, there are five members on our team. Two of them are full-time, and then we have three part-time members. And you'll see from this slide, we've really been holding at two FTEs for four of the last four and a half years of this initiative. Um, and so we really hope to like, to continue to grow as an office and continue to do the amazing work that we've been able to do with such a small team. Um, the last thing that I'll note here is that our budget did jump substantially this last fiscal year. And that was because of two things. One, we got a one-time funding from the county for the Dorm Youth Leadership Fund that I mentioned earlier. The city also awarded us some carryover funds to put to the fund as well. And then we received an award for $15,000 from United Way as a part of our, uh, our partnership with Protecting Our Dignity Coalition. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna pass it on to Lara um, to continue about what we are, where we are going from here. But if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them later. Thank you, Elise. All right. So where do we want to go from here? Um, all right. First, we want to share a vision for the coming years with you. We want to see young people as key stakeholders in the issues that we all face in the community, and we want to see this normalized. Uh, we want to see their full partnership in our youth violence prevention efforts, uh, transportation, the way we determine budget priorities, and among other things. Uh, we know the community gang assessment, for example, was just released, and we want to see young people's equal partners in the action planning that follows up or follows up that release of that report. Uh, we want to see more coordination and alignment among those who support and work with young people. We want to see them be more responsive to what young people need and want, especially those who have been most excluded. And we want to see young people celebrated for their brilliance uh, and contributions that they're making as of today. So to that end, we're proposing that the renewed ILA encompassing initiative with these three goals, currently it is focused on a, a position. So it would expand into a goal focused ILA. There are a few strategies that are explicitly mentioned in the ILA, but in general, we want to keep it broad and evergreen enough so that it can be responsive to whatever is emerging as community priorities. Um, for goal one, we will continue our consultation that Elise talked about for building youth leadership, hosting our ambassador program, um, and we are we are requesting funds from the county to actually expand that ambassador program by five to make it 15. Um, for strategy for goal number two, we're looking at ongoing youth engagement, ongoing data collection so we can stay relevant, so we can continue to iterate, continue to be responsive to what people in the community are telling us that they need and want and more intensive support for a smaller cohort of providers. So this would be around two of the community grants that Elise mentioned that were also part of our county budget request for the upcoming fiscal year. And last but not least, um, this goal that we're super excited about is uh, a lot, there's a lot of youth-led work happening in Durham. Supporting that work, shining a light on it is actually part of an overall strategy towards hearing from more people, 
seeing them as leaders, following their lead, and just being in general reminded of how brilliant they are. Uh, just a couple of highlights of the renewed ILA. We did want to um, uh, note that we are recommending a narrower age range focus. The age range currently specified in the ILA is 5 to 24, which I don't think I need to tell anyone is a huge range. There are lots of different needs in that range. It's not really a uh, possible for us to effectively address all of them. So we're proposing this narrower range of 13 to 24 years. This is where, when we look at our three goals, where they intersect, right, in this age range, it allows us to have more focus, uh, economies of scale. And we also know, as we've even heard earlier in this meeting, there are a lot of pressing priorities um, in our community right now, such as jobs and violence prevention, which impacts this age range. Um, and there's been a lot of investments over the last four years to address the needs of younger children. So it's not exclusive, but it's more of a focus and we'll continue to collaborate with our partners who work with the younger age group um, so that we can coordinate across the age spectrum. And, um, I mentioned that at Monday's meeting, the commissioners had asked for a slight amendment to the ILA. I'll note that here, which is just they wanted explicit language about regular reporting uh, of updates to both of the boards. So we'll add a statement to the youth initiatives manager responsibilities for at least annual reports to uh, both the city council and board of county commissioners. All right, so this last slide, is really just a picture. I'm not gonna talk through every element of it, of the city and county investments and the fiscal year 23 budget requests related to the overall youth initiatives work. Uh, the takeaway here is that since the initiative is based in the Office on Youth and the work of the office and the ILA are aligned, we look at the total Office on Youth budget when we talk about total investments in strategic youth initiatives. So in other words, the ILA is budget is just part of the overall youth initiatives budget. You can see the ILA part highlighted in blue. And so if, for example, all the new city and county requests are funded, the ILA will compose about 50%, 56%, I think, of the total office on youth budget. Um, so yeah, for the renewal, we're proposing ILA commitments that aren't split exactly in half as they are now, but move the overall investments from the city and county closer to parity. Um, and I think with that, I'll stop and we can have a conversation and take questions. Wow, wow, wow. Can I tell you, I'm up here, I have been up here dancing in my seat. I am so, I mean, literally dancing in my seat. That that made my day right, right there. Um, I'm gonna open up to my colleagues, um, Thank you for a fantastic job. Well done, well done. You have my, my brain spinning. Um, just wow, 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 wow. So I'll open up to my colleagues for any questions or comments they may have before I'll, I'll finish with a few. Councilwoman John. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Laura and Elise for the presentation um, and for all of the work that y'all have been doing over the last few years. It's really great to get this update um, and to learn a little bit more about all of the exciting changes and plans that y'all have for the office. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the transition is going um, to, the, uh, to the Change by Youth Ambassador Program um, and just a little bit more about the work that the, um, that the youth are doing in that program and um, how it might, how you feel it's more uh, impactful than the Durham Youth Commission and are like, are y'all satisfied with, with the new program and how everything is going? Yeah, I can start us off there. And then if Laura has anything to add, um, so I'll say, I'll start by like kind of setting some frame for the DYC or the Durham Youth, and, ooh, <laughs> um, Durham Youth Commission. So at, towards the end of the DYC, we had about uh, 
or when I came, when I was hired, we had 30 DYC members. Um, while we had some kind of racial diversity amongst the DYC, we really had mostly young people who were really high achieving in school. And the DYC really focused on service learning. So they went out and did community service projects um, and volunteerism, right? So they would go to some of the food shelters and pass out food on the weekends. Um, they did an annual event around uh, toys, like a toy drive to trade in like kind of violent toys, like guns um, for like nonviolent toys. Um, and then they were a part of a youth state youth council network. So really the scope of the DYC was mostly around volunteerism and service learning. So though we had 30 young people, I would say that the impact of the DYC was really on the, the young people who were mostly engaged. And we had a lot of turnover throughout the year and we would have about maybe 15 young people who were really engaged throughout the year, right? When you're doing service learning and volunteerism, you wanna have a lot of numbers so that you can pull, right? You can pull a lot of people into different opportunities. But since we shifted our scope to youth leadership and decision-making, it made sense that we shifted the scope of the DYC as well, right? So right now with our Change by Youth Ambassador Program, we have 11 youth. We were budgeted for 10, but we had some extra funds in the office, so we were able to hire an extra young person. These young people are not working on volunteer opportunities. They are consultants, youth consultants to the city of Durham. Um, and so of our 11 young people, they have worked on a total of 18 projects so far this year. That includes comprehensive plan, that includes the county's kid vote in Durham. Um, we have some young people on the DPS Foundation's mental health initiative. Um, when we did a youth count for young people experiencing houselessness in Durham, we had young people there as well. Um, and I just, oh, and then the DPRs, Dorm Parks and Rec, New Aquatics commun Community um, Advisory Board, we have young people in there as well. Um, so we've, our young people with the ambassador program are really consultants and have decision-making um, authority in the roles that they have where the DYC was mostly just volunteering, right? And so to answer your question, um, council member, I would say that I am very excited, not just about what the ambassador program has been able to do, right? Cause this is quality, the quality of their work um, is really what we've highlighted as our values in our office. Um, and we are hoping to expand to another uh, five young people to have 15 seats. We see this as something that could be scalable, right? But this is our pilot year. We really wanted to take our time with it. Um, and I wish, yeah, I'll stop there. Did I answer your question? And Laura, do you have anything to to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was great. Thanks, Elise. Anyone I will else? add, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I will add that in, as a parallel and kind of connected effort also, we have started looking at the various boards and commissions uh, between the city and the county to look at the youth seats that exist on those boards and commissions and which ones um, could have youth seats and starting a process of uh, assessing um, sort of areas where we can bring a robot, a more robust youth adult lens to boards where it makes sense. We've been working with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, for example, or BPAC um, in their expansion of youth seats, promoting for those seats. We're also doing training for that commission um, around youth adult partnership, I think in a couple of weeks here, and we'll also be supporting the young people who fill those seats. And we've been doing some similar work with the Racial Equity Commission as well, doing some targeted recruitment because I know those seats were kind of hard to fill and we're in the process of that right now. So um, we're that we see that as kind of part of this overall purpose and focus on youth leadership, youth adult partnership 
in areas where decisions are being made, policies, programs, recommendations to council and commissioners, et cetera. Thank you. We had the um, a youth representative appointment for BPAC on our agenda today and had three great applicants. So thank you for, for doing that work. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, uh, our great folk from the Office of Youth. I, you know, n not really a question, but just commendations and celebration. Um, I've always I've always been amazed how um, societies and culture have been able to identify and foster prodigies and, and genius when from classical pianists to gymnasts when they're very, very, very young. Uh, so I'm very excited. I, I'd love to see that type of energy when it comes to government and leadership as well, to creating those environments where we, we foster this type of engagement with our young people when they're very, very young, as young as possible, as you do in other areas. And I, and I think this, this goes right to the heart of it. This, I'm so excited about the work product uh, coming out of this office uh, and this initiative. Uh, Councilmember Johnson, I like the way you always manage to get into a cool picture with these kids as well. You, you're always <laughs> so like, where's Waldo? Right in the middle of them. Uh, so, so kudos to, to uh, the work they're doing. I hope that all of the recommendations and requests will make it into the manager's ask uh, for the budget uh, this year. I look forward to supporting them. Congratulations on great work. We look forward to celebrating and continuing to support what really is and should be uh, the future of our city. Nay, the right now of our city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Freeman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I also just want to echo my colleagues' support and just acknowledge that there's been a huge transformation that has occurred um, in the Office on Youth. And I want to thank Madam Mayor, Madam Manager Page for really taking hold of that and supporting the way that you're actually ro rotating, not just in your own office, but also in, in collaboration with the county um, and the work that they're doing. And so I want to say that I'm excited, um, and so I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem Middleton mentioning, you know, how far back can we go? Because you know, I like to work with the babies as, as early as, as possible. And I, I know that this, this work is just getting started. And so the visits that we had from the third graders recently is just one piece. And so what that looks like for third, fourth, and fifth graders, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, I really want to hear more about that. Um, and I also would love to know um, how you're engaging with the workforce and economic development um, to make sure that these 1,500 slots are actually getting filled. And so I know on this agenda we have um, Made in Durham, you know, pushing out, trying to get some work product together to make sure that their business is aligned and there are opportunities for these youth. But I really, really want to see a lot more collaboration across um, our city departments and our county. And I would not limit it to that. I would also say that we need to go on the road and show other cities how to do it. So I appreciate looking, and I appreciate any opportunity to, to talk about what you're doing. And I thank you for the report. I'm sorry, I'm looking down at the Zoom. I was <laughs> looking up, but yeah. Thank you to my colleagues. I want to make sure that everybody has had their say before I take a, a brief moment to, to say some things. Um, Kudos. Kudos. Great job. Yeah. Well, I, like I indicated earlier, I've, I've literally been up here dancing in my seat. It's always amazing to me the, to see the, um, to actually see and hear and feel the good work that the city of Durham is doing in this arena. And, and how, much, how far we are. Um, and, and so I thank you all for, for doing great work and purposeful work. Uh, I, am, I am a believer in mentors. As, as a mayor, I am, I am still being mentored and, and hope to mentor more. So I understand the need for us to prepare our young people as soon as possible for these roles. So I have been talking with the city manager up here. We've been going back and forth a little bit about some of the things that the city council is going to be doing, and we hope to engage you all uh, in this process and our young, through you all, our young people. The city council hopefully will be taking a deep dive in the area of housing. So this is a prime opportunity for us to engage 
our young people in that necessary conversation as we attempt to learn uh, what housing in Durham really looks like. Also in the area of transportation, there are a lot of moving parts to that, and I will encourage a deeper conversation. And I'd love to be able to do that with you all about um, how we can engage our young people in that. And the one thing that I do want to, that I've noticed uh, just across the spectrum in, in Durham, that there is um, a, a lack of knowledge sometimes about how the governments work here in Durham, Durham City, Durham County, um, you know, the, the court system. And I am very interested in trying to produce some type of video uh, that we can showcase our young people sh telling their, uh, their colleagues exactly what we do and how this is made up. And I know, I'm looking at my fellow council folk, and I know that they will all be willing to engage just so that we can begin to teach you all um, at an early age what this process looks like and how to get ready to prepare the next generation of leaders. So thank you all for a fantastic job. Um, you've made my day today. You've made my day today. And we Thank will... you so much for this opportunity. We will now turn to our next pulled item, which will be item eight. And item eight um, is the contract with Dixie Lawn Service for right of way moving and litter removal services. I believe that that item was pulled by Mayor Pro Tem, uh, and our resource person is Mr. Alexander Johnson. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and members of council. Um, I'm available for questions. I don't have a, a comprehensive um, presentation to show you. I just wanted to um, indicate what this contract is for and, and answer any questions that uh, we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you, and I appreciate you being with us. Is there a representative from Dixie Lawn Service here? Um, he has. Uh, we do have the president of the um, of the company, um, and he has. Uh, Mr. James McHenry. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Thank you uh, for being with us today. Just a, a couple of questions um, about Dixie Lawn Service. I I, I know the. Um, company's been been engaged with us since 1999 and I know there's a tendency in government sometimes to just kind of do things by inertia and when the relationship's been established but I, I did have some questions about um, the demographics uh, of, of your workforce if you don't mind, is mr. president can you hear me are you on madam clerk madam clerk mr. McHenry Name is James McHenry. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? James McHenry will be the president of that company. I believe he's on virtually. He, he did sign up, brother. Mr. McHenry is not in the queue, Madam Mayor. I believe his telephone number is indicated with a 704 prefix. He may be on mute. Mr. Uh, Mr. McHenry, we can see your telephone number. but we probably need for you to unmute it if you can. You may try star six to unmute yourself, sir.
Madam Mayor, the telephone number is no longer in the queue. Madam Mayor, in the interest of time, while we try and get him back, if you'd like to move on to the next poll, I, I'd be more than happy to wait. All right, we'll you... see if he'll come back. Yes, ma'am. Online, and we'll turn to item number nine, which was uh, the second amendment to contract number 17430, supplemental agreement number two with Kim Lee Horn and Associates Durham County Transit Plan. Our research person is Ms. Mario Klein. I believe this item was pulled by Councilwoman Freeman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just had a couple of questions. Um, just reading through, I acknowledge the, the three areas of factors that are extenuating the 257,000 for um, essentially more engagement with the community, I'm assuming. But I just yes. wanted to get some more information about the partner agencies and the plan around the, uh, I guess, what the plan looked like around that type of um, engagement. And specifically, I'll say, I wanted to know if you were recovering responses around the bus service and if this engagement will include uh, committees like our public facing mayor's committee uh, uh, with people with, with different abilities or even the mayor. So, Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, um, Aaron Kane with the DCH CMPO. Uh, yes, we will be uh, using a process similar to what we used in the first two rounds of engagement on the Durham Transit Plan. It will be multifaceted. Uh, we will uh, be meeting with a variety of stakeholder groups, um, including uh, NCCU, Duke, um, the Mayor's Committee on People with Disabilities and a variety of other groups. Uh, we met with about two dozen of those kinds of stakeholder groups uh, last time, and we plan to reach out to them again in this okay. phase. In addition to that, we will be continuing our Engagement Ambassadors Program, uh, working with Ideal Ortiz to uh, reach back out to those folks to make sure that we hear from uh, previously underrepresented groups and make sure that they have a chance to weigh in on uh, the preferred scenario and make adjustments based on the comments we hear from that, as well as um, doing what we call pop-up events, going to areas of high, high ridership, uh, such as the village and Durham Station and engaging people one-on-one -on -one to get comments through that program. Thank you. It would probably be really helpful if just a statement that you're going to use the city's current equitable engagement process or procedure um, was included in the memo. That way I already know okay. that would be the best, okay. the best thing. And then just acknowledging that $257,000, I'm hoping that there's a lot of in-person meetings and not just virtual. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, we will, we will meet in person whenever possible and whenever the folks we are meeting with are comfortable with that. Absolutely. Thank you, that's all. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, are there any other questions for, for this item? If not, I think we're still attempting to, I think the president of uh, Dixie is going to try to rejoin us, so we'll move to our next pulled item and return once he's joined. Our next pool item will be item 11. Uh, the award of a service contract to Taylor Meter Technologies for the large meter inspection and testing service project. Our resource person is Jerry Monroe, and we also have a person um, from Taylor Meter Technologies, Mr. Corey Taylor, on that line. This item was pulled by Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, members of Council, uh, Don Greeley, Water Management, here to answer any questions that you have concerning this item. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, Don. Good to see you. Um, good afternoon. Hope you're well. J just very quickly, the large meters, are, are these all commercial users of, of these uh, meters? Um, yes, yes, they are. The, the largest meters, um, they serve Duke University, Duke medical throughout the um, the county, you know, NCCU, uh, the, the large industries out at RTP and um, out at Traverne. Um, so they're, 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 all, they're all commercial meters. The, the process, and I, I remember maybe a year, two years ago, we were um, having issues with, with connectivity between some of our drivers driving around and using 
you know, signals to check meters on private homes. Is it the same process checking these meters? Is it done remotely with a, a sensor, or do you have to actually get out and, and, and read these? No, we, we have radio read meters on these meters um, to, to read them monthly. Okay, so it, 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 it's, the, it's the same, at least in, maybe not in scale, but in, in process, it's the same as when we're reading meters at private residences uh, as well? Correct. And, and this is to, this contract in, in front of you is concerning to make sure that the meters are reading accurately. So the meters will be tested to make sure they're accurately registering the water that's going through them. Was, is, is the frequency of issues with the meters, um, I, don't, I don't know if failing is the right word, but I remember that we had a number of people that had problems with water bills because of issues with either trees blocking the sensor or whatever batteries. Is the frequency with the uh, commercial ones uh, similar to uh, the, the frequency of issues with commercial ones similar to ones in private residences? And is this what this contract is seeking to, to mitigate? No, we've actually had uh, very much success with our larger meters when it comes to the radio read meters. Mm -hmm. um, they very rarely, you know, we find any problems with being able to read them or with the batteries or, or the meter. Um, what this uh, is about is the larger meters over time can lose their accuracy. And usually when meters lose their accuracy, they tend to underread the volume of water that is going through the meter. So this is to ensure that the meters aren't losing that accuracy and um, and to recalibrate the meter if, if need be. Got you. All right. Thank you. That That's all I had. Very helpful. I appreciate you. Good to see sure. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam yep. Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Freeman. Just one question. I just wanted to know if there was a specific tier um, for the commercial meters around the one million and up, I guess, Mark. I just wasn't sure. No, all, all of our commercial accounts are billed at tier three all of them. So regardless yep. of however much um, water they use, it's just tier three. Correct. And is there any conversation or looking into like, I guess, research into how that's having impact for some of the, some of those that aren't using a million? Um, that's evaluated annually when we, when we have the rate presentation, I can elaborate a little bit more on that, but you know, every year we look at whether or not those, you know, how that should be adjusted and you know, how much income and revenue those meters are brought in. So that's reviewed annually. Thank you. I just wanted to give you a preview of some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. I appreciate you today. Sure. I believe unless there are any further questions on that item, we can return to Mr. James McHenry. Uh, for item number eight, which Councilman, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton had pulled. Uh, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. President, can you hear me? And if you would press star six on your telephone, Mr. McHenry, that may allow you to unmute. Hello? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, 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 are, are, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Mr. Okay, McHenry, I'm good afternoon. James McHenry with Dixie. Good afternoon, yes, sir. sir. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Mark Anthony Middleton here at Durham City Council. Uh, just, just had a couple of questions about your item. Um, I, I, you may, I don't know if you heard my uh, initial uh, on-ramp comments, but I, I recognize that you've been uh, in relationship with us and others since about 1999. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I, I was looking at some of the your uh, contract or uh, workforce diversity questionnaire and some of the, the demographic information on, on your workforce. And 1999 is a significant amount of time uh, to be in relationship with us. And I, I noticed that you have, you have 265 employees in the entire company, correct? Yes, I do. I, um, I do work all over, uh, you know, uh, in several states. How, how many of your employees are African-American in your universal workforce? I, I could answer that question without, you know, having to go back through. Um, I've, um, since we're a seasonal business, we use a lot of uh, H-2B workers that we uh, bring in from uh, Mexico and South America just because of uh, 
being a seasonal business, um, you know, we can bring them in and, and, and we use a lot of those people where in the past, I guess we've used more, um, you know, people from the United States, but it's just been so difficult to hire anybody, you know, hire people that, um, you know, we rely on that program a little bit more, but we try to hire all the local people that we can. And uh, we're actually in the past, we worked with a subcontractor who's a minority there in Durham to, to do, you know, that we subcontract our litter work to. So the number 265, is that number static or not? Do you have at this, as of today, how many employees does your company have? We're uh, very close to that number now because we're in the middle of the mowing season. You know, eight months out of the year, we've got a large number of people working for us. And then during the winter time, our, you know, our workforce goes down to, uh, uh, you know, less than 50 people that are, you know, full-time people. And uh, we're very so, seasonally oriented sorry. business. So, uh, so it's kind of close to 265 today. And of that number, you, you have no sense as to how many black people work in your company? Um, no, sir, not. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to tell you a number that's not correct. I mean, I, you know. Um, you got a ballpark as of how many black employees you have? Send it to you. I'm sorry? I said we could compile that information and try to get, you know, get it back to you. This is um, on the, um, on your questionnaire, the, the, the information for the local um, employ for the primary location, that would be Durham is filled out. I, and by my read, there are eight, they're going to be about eight people doing the work in the field. They're all um, Hispanic. Is that according to this uh, document? Does, does that sound familiar to you? 100% of the folk are Hispanic that are going to be working in the Durham area? Hispanic, and then, I mean, there's a, there's a Hispanic, and then we use, I mean, we've got a, uh, um, you know, a lady that we use, uh, Cherie, and she does our litter, and she does some other people. So yes, so 100% of the folk that are going to be working in the primary area, which will be Durham, are Hispanic, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a real good uh, uh, connection here, and I keep breaking up, and, I'm, I'm, and I apologize for that. That's all right. We'll take a very we'll, good internet connection we'll, where I am. We'll get through it. We'll take the time you need. The, the, um, so on your workforce diversity questionnaire, Part B, employee diversity breakdown for the consolidated company is not filled out at all. Why not? And staff, if you want to chime in as well as to why this part of the questionnaire wasn't filled out, um, whoever the, the relevant staff person is, feel free as well. Mr. Well, President, can, did you hear that question? That, I can answer the question. Um, Per the instructions on the contractor work, workforce and diversity um, diversity uh, questionnaire, uh, it's a uh, if then statement. So if the staff that are being applied to the work of this contract are going to be pulled from the larger um, staffing resources of the company, then they need to fill out table B. But um, so my understanding of the instructions uh, basically necessitates the vendor to fill out section A if they intend to supply a specific workforce to work on this specific contract and not draw from their larger pool of personnel resources. Absolutely, and I did see that. I, I've been looking at a lot of these things over the years, and I've never seen one not, usually folk, when they do have diversity throughout the company, they've usually seen that as an opportunity to kind of brag on it and kind of buttress their standing, whether they were pulling from it or not. So uh, you're right, and I, I saw that parenthetically listed, but it would seem, you know, I, usually companies want to let us know uh, about their overall company, particularly since they've alluded to their universal workforce. I mean, there's obviously not 265 people working in Durham. It's only eight. 
And since that total workforce number was part of what's being reported to us, you know, to, to me that provided sufficient on-ramp to ask about the makeup of their, their total workforce. Um, but Mr. President, getting back to the, the um, questionnaire, um, there's a question that says, when you recruit for employees, do you only recruit by word of mouth? You said no. And um, do you focus any recruitment efforts in the local Durham area? You said internet ads, Facebook, and posters. Where, where, where is your company hung posters in Durham? Um, um, I'm not exactly sure. You know, I, I guess I answered that question pretty much as far as what we do universally. I mean, maybe not there. Um, we well, and hence my well, yeah, hence my questions about the universal makeup. There's no for the DOT, but I mean, we put out posters for that type work. Well, the you're breaking up a little. The, it says, if yes, please provide examples how you focus I'm, recruit. Hello. I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I, I I'm only hearing about maybe at best every other word, so I'm I'm, I'm not able to answer these questions very well because I I can't hear them. Okay. If do you have access to Zoom, or perhaps another connection? Because we this this matters before us, and and I I think these are really important questions that we get some answer on. Um, you know, pursuant to our approval of this contract. So, do you need to find a more secure connection, Mr. President? Actually, jobs are very, very limited cell phone connection. I mean, we, we can, would you like to try and get on Zoom or, or have staff provide you, or do you want to soldier through right here? Can you hear me? Mr. President, can you hear me? No, I, I cannot hear you. Okay. All right, I heard, can you hear me, and that's it. Staff, can we do something maybe to kind of work with him to get a, a more secure connection? But I, I'd like these questions answered, and if I don't want to take too much time, wait, so if we can find a better connection for the President. Madam Mayor, I'll yield back at the connection, but there's sorry. Madam Clerk, do we have um, a better way of making sure that the president is able to fully answer Mayor Pro Tem's question? Madam Mayor, real quick question. If, if uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton is, is, is open to it, could we have staff provide us the information via email? Or if the, if the gentleman is willing to send us an email with the information since we're having such a hard time? Thank you. I don't think the staff would be able to, to answer these questions for, for on his behalf. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. And excuse me a moment. Uh, I tried to call Mr. McHenry and the call went to voicemail. Madam Mayor, I, I'll, I'll yield back at this time, but I'm going to ask that this item be placed on GBA if, if we don't get him back today. All right. We will do that. That will be item eight. We'll place that on GBA if he's not able to reconnect. With an invitation for him to attend that meeting on that Monday. All right, we will now move to item 12, I believe, which is a proposed water and sewer rates for FY 2022 to 2023. Uh, that is our research person is gonna be Ms. Vicki Westbrook. This is a presentation. I wanted to look and make sure that we are ready to proceed with this one or would you rather take a break. We do have to, we do need to be able to give our um, closed captioning persons a break um, after the two hour mark, I believe, which would be a little bit after this. So it's at your pleasure. 
Council. We're ready to we ready to proceed with this one, and then we'll take a break. We don't actually need to take a break. Okay. All right. Well, we will proceed. All right. Uh, we'll take a little short break after this one. Okay. All right. Good. Is that okay? Good. All right. We'll take a little break after this. I believe it's Ms. Westbrook with our resource first. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, Don Greeley, uh, Department of Water Management. I'll be presenting today. Um, I hope you can see the presentation in front of you. Um, I, I'd like to start out uh, first, uh, briefly before I get started. Um, two quick comments. One, I'd like to thank you, Mayor O'Neill and members of Council for your ongoing encouragement and support of uh, encouraging our residents in Durham to fill up their water bottles um, with our award-winning water rather than buy bottled water. Um, I, I've heard numerous comments from <laughs> council members and yourself um, doing that and I wanna extend our appreciation from our department. And also um, on behalf of the department, I'd like to thank uh, city manager Page and deputy city manager Johnson for their ongoing support of to meet the needs of the city's water and sewer utility, especially around our increased operating costs, our capital um, improvement program, and the utility rates, which are in front of you for consideration today. Um, with in proposing the 2000, the rates for uh, next fiscal year, um, the rates are based on a 10 year financial model. Um, we work closely with our financial um, consultant, which is Raptelis Financial Consultants, as well as the Finance Department. It's a joint effort that reviews all the inputs to the financial model. Um, our goal is to try to smooth out any rate increases that might um, so and to minimize rate shock with all of our, um, our, our residents and customers. Um, a quick utility overview, you know, we, the Department of Water Management um, oversees our two reservoirs, our two water treatment plants, our, our two water reclamation facilities, as well as over 2,500 miles of water and sewer lines, numerous booster um, stations, as well as lift stations. We serve over 300,000 people and manage over 99,000 um, accounts. Is the screen advancing? Uh, it's advancing on my screen, but I don't know if it's advancing on your screen. There we go. There's a little delay. Um, next slide. Um, the outline for today's presentation will be um, reviewing the rate objectives, um, strategies and key issues around the rates. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the capital improvement program and customer consumption, since these are important inputs into the rate models and you know, getting the rates. Um, as well as talk about the proposed rates themselves. Um, in looking at our rate setting objectives, um, as in prior years, we have three objectives with setting rates. The first is affordability um, to make sure our rates are fair and equitable to our customers, um, that our rates are sustainable in that we address all of the increased operating costs for the utility, as well as to fund the long-term capital needs of the utility. And we also want to encourage water efficiency and conservation. Um, we want the rates to, uh, we continue with our tiered rates approach to, to promote conservation and it, that the rates are cost-based, meaning that the, the residents um, have control of of uh, you know, their consumption and, and how much water they consume and therefore how much water they're billed for. Um, when we talk about affordability, um, as I mentioned, we want to uh, empower our customers to manage their costs. Um, we want to minimize the impacts to customers in the lower tiers. Um, and we want to implement programs to assist low and fixed in income customers. Um, but, you know, especially, you know, when you think of um, a lot of times we think of low and fixed income customers 
who are in the lower tiers, but that's not necessarily true because um, large families or single parent families with large children could be um, in tier three and tier four. So we really want to make sure that the our, our, our rates are set to to not impact or to impact them as little as possible. Um, in looking at historically, um, our rates, um, the graph that will come up shortly, um, gives you an, an overview of where the rates have been over the last several years and where we're projecting to um, bring the rates. And this is the shows the average monthly um, bill that uh, the different tiers um, receive. Um, you'll note that over 95% of our single family customers are, are in tiers one, two, three, and four. Um, and, you know, and certainly you know, tiers one and two represents almost 75% of our customer base. So once again, it's really important for us to, when we look at and uh, build the financial model and look at any rate increases, we wanna minimize the, the impacts and keep any rate increases small and to which in turn keeps the overall bill that they're receiving monthly um, to be as low as possible. Um, another portion of making sure our rates are affordable comes around to you know dealing with our customers. You know we um, are at any given time we are willing to make payment arrangements with our customers um, either um, and to assist um, to be able to spread their payments um, out over time if need be. Um, this allows the customers flexibility on the dates of when um, they might be able to pay. Um, we've seen um, a, a drop this year in payment arrangements, but certainly last year we had a, a last fiscal year we had a, a large number when we transitioned back from um, not doing cutoffs to doing cutoffs. Um, currently, we have um, about five five hundred customers this year that have come in and asked for payment arrangements, and they can be anywhere from moving a payment out a couple weeks to spreading payments out over several months or even longer up to a year. So um, kudos to our staff. Um, Heidi Hackett, the utility finance manager, Crystal Harris and Kathy Compton, who are billing managers and our customer service managers who oversee our staff and working with our customers to make sure that um, we can work out payment arrangement that, that meets our individual customer needs. Um, for those customers who are still struggling to be able to afford um, their utility bill, you know, the city has a, a hardship fund, which uh, um, customers who qualify can receive up to $240 annually to help pay their outstanding bills. Um, it, this offers kind of a, a clean site for customers to for their bills going forward. We also work closely with um, two other programs um, for the larger bills. Um, it's a partnership with Access HCO, which provides assistance for larger bills and frequently customers that are, that qualify under that program see most of their their bill um, uh, assisted so they can get their their water and sewer bills back in good standing with. So um, that's been a tremendous program. The hardship fund itself um, this year. Um, $150,000 was allocated out of the general fund for the hardship fund. Um, year to date spending on that hardship fund is about 81,000, almost $82,000. Um, we anticipate spending another 30,000 by the end of the year um, for a total of about $110,000. Um, uh, we're spending less in the hardship fund. Um, uh, that's be, um, been years past, and that's because of these other programs that we're working with, the Access H2O and the um, Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. Um, that's we uh, partner, you know, which is um, a state-funded program that's managed through the Durham County Department of Social Services. So we work through them to um, help meet um, customer needs when it comes to paying their water and sewer bill. Um, overall, um, when it comes to customers, our billing continues to be um, 
less than half it was pre-COVID when it comes to cutoffs. A lot of that had to do with all of the outreach that our customer billing services staff did when we resumed um, cutoffs after the hiatus when you know, COVID first started and suspended cutoffs. Um, and because of that, we were able to reach out and touch a lot of customers who were struggling in the past. So we've been able to maintain that much, you know, less than 50% cutoff rate um, for the last year. And that continues to trend, um, to stay relatively flat, which is very encouraging. Um, and also because of all the hard work from the staff and all the outreach that we now do with our customers. Um, and moving to the overall rate strategies um, when it comes to uh, managing the rates and setting the rates, uh, our goal is to continue to have small annual rate increases to minimize the impacts to our customers, as I mentioned earlier, to cover all of our operating CIP and regulatory costs. Um, we need to continue to build infrastructure to access our Jordan Lake allocation and to, to meet future demand. Um, as I mentioned, we try to smooth out our borrowing um, as well as manage the debt to the benefit of the rate payers, not necessarily the, the bond ratings. And of course, the utility bond ratings are, are extremely high. The capital improvement program, uh, when you look over the next um, five years, it, it totals almost for appropriations, uh, $766 million. Um, this is for appropriations. Um, the rate model is built on actual spending as opposed to appropriations, but appropriations are needed, um, an authorization to spend that money is needed to be able to um, move forward with our projects. Um, you see 280 million um, for water projects and $484 million for sewer projects. For That is broken out on the next slide. Um, into uh, where that $766 million is allocated, 77 for our dams and reservoirs, 73 million for our water treatment plant, um, 205 million for the water reclamation facilities, 129 million for the water distribution system, 276 for the sewer collection system, and a little bit for facility paving. Um, a lot of the infrastructure for the distribution and collection system that we're rehabilitating and replacing is over 100 years old. And um, most of our projects take anywhere from two to six years with the larger water resource type projects like the um, to getting access to Jordan Lake through our Western Intake Partnership project is that's a, a can take up to 10 to 12 years to, to construct. Please stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, when we look at uh, another uh, key component into looking at the rates and the rate model is the usage and consumption. Um, what you see here is the average daily demand um, of our use system, which is when you look at it, although it, it goes up and down, it seems relatively flat. And you know, at first glance, this is surprising considering all the growth that we've had in Durham. Um, but I think a lot of the, it, there's a couple different factors that play into that. Certainly we've had a lot of redevelopment and the redevelopment in Durham, you take out very inefficient uh, water fixtures and put in water efficient um, fixtures and that actually lowers the consumption. Um, a lot of the industries have looked at their water practices um, and have improved um, how they can potentially recycle or reduce their water consumption um, there's been a move away of some industry water, um, high water consumption industries um, have moved away and been replaced by other industries. So um, overall, um, it's growing slowly, but it's still not you know, surging up, which is um, which is a good sign for us because we don't want to see a big spike in consumption. Um, but um, in looking at the single family residential by tiers. Um, once again, this is the information that was shown um, uh, on the, the affordability when you look at the percent of customers. So majority of our customers are in those first four tiers and certainly the over almost 75% of our customers are in tier one and tier two. So it's once again, really important to keep those, those costs in those tiers low. Um, 
the proposed rates for FY23. Um, uh, the proposed budget, um, uh, the overall budget for the utility is 120 million, slightly over $120 million. 34% um, of that is personal services, 27 operations and maintenance expenses, 24% rate funded CIP and 15% debt service. Um, if you look at overall projecting the overall needs of the utility over the next um, several fiscal years, um, if we didn't adjust rates, you know, there would certainly be a, a shortfall in, in each of the next several years if we wanted to continue, if we did not increase our rates. And once again, I, I apologize for the, the lag in the, the slides from my speaking. Um, the proposed rates for FY23, um, there'll be a modest increase in the service and consumption charges. Um, I'm gonna let the slides catch up if you don't, if you just bear with me a minute. Once again, I apologize for the technology delay. There we go. Um, there'll be a modest increase to the service and consumption charges to all the tiers. Um, we'll continue to have the penny per tier increase um, for the watershed protection. Um, you know, based on usage, customers will see different percent increases to their actual bills um, based on their consumption and, and where they fall within the tiers. Um, all single family customers, um, you know, use water and the usage moves into the higher tiers and they build at the higher rates. So um, once again, the it's it's um, building blocks. If a customer moves out of, is typically in tier two and then moves into tier three, um, you know, the first part of the bill is built at tier one, the second part is built at tier two, and then the next part is built at tier three. So um, whereas um, we build the commercial multifamily resident, the uh, multifamily residential, industrial institutional customers at the tier three rate. So all of their water is billed at the tier three rate and irrigation accounts are billed at the tier five rate. Um, we're continuing to propose the um, double rates outside the uh, city limits. Um, those customers that are served by the, the Durham County wastewater plant will see slightly different sewer charges based on the county's uh, adoption of, of their, their rates for uh, their sewer treatment. The overall proposed increases um, will cover the department's operating costs for FY23, any paper performance um, that's enacted uh, with our staff, um, pay as you go, uh, capital improvement program funding, all of the debt service, uh, as well as the utility fleet replacement fund for replacing any of the utility utilities uh, vehicles. Uh, and that's managed by the fleet, uh, fleet maintenance department. Um, and then the, the general transfer that for um, services provided by the general fund um, that they're billed, the utility fund is billed for. Um, the proposed rates maintain the necessary debt covenants and maintains the minimum of 180 days of operating and maintenance costs for reserves. Um, the, the next slide shows the overall uh, increases, um, both for the service charges and the individual uh, tiered rates. So a 42 cent increase on the service charge for water a 41 cent increase for the service charge for sewer, um, and then small incremental rates for the, the different tiers. There we go. Um, 
the next slide uh, shows graphically um, shows the um, inc increase um, to each of the tiers. Like at tier one, we'll see a dollar. The average tier one um, customer uses about 108 um, cubic feet of water uh, monthly. Um, so, so their bill will go up a, a dollar and five, five cents. The, um, the next slide shows a price comparison of what that actually represents when you actually look at the um, uh, cost of the increase that is, a, is roughly the equivalent of, of one 20 ounce bottle of water or two thirds of a cup of coffee um, at Starbucks. Um, and as, or, you know, for tier, tier five, that represents seven original glazed doughnuts from Krispy Kreme. Once again, we use this slide to show um, you know, how customers um, could easily save money by you know, using filling up their water bottles with city of Durham water. Because um, as you can see, one gallon of our tap water only costs 0. 0.0048 cents per gallon or dollars per gallon. We think that's a great deal. Um, and next, we show the uh, comparison for the monthly commercial uh, inside rates. So a 5 h meter commercial account, we'll see a $6.59 increase on their bill. So for the, the proposed rates um, for the next five years, uh, is shown on the next two slides. Um, is 3.9% and that's for the typical tier three customer. Um, it includes a 4.1% increase for water and a 3.8% increase in sewer. Um, certainly the future increases are needed to support the infrastructure renewal programs and the CIP and any other growth related projects. And certainly you're starting to see the impacts from, from Jordan Lake. Um, also what's impacting the rates um, is the, um, the fact that over the last several years, we've been spending down our operating reserves um, to keep the rates lower. And um, we've gotten to the point now where we have spent down the operating reserves to close to the 180 days of, that's, that we need to, to keep in the reserves. And, um, and also we're seeing a, a significant increase in operating costs, especially around chemicals and electricity um, have jumped drastically um, this year. And we anticipate that, that to carry over into next year. Um, we are, although, you know, we've been very fortunate to be in the, the 2%, 3% over the last several years. Um, but as I said, with, with all of those factors entering in, we're seeing the rates creep up. Um, Durham itself is still very fortunate, both regionally um, in North Carolina and in the Southeast to have still relatively low increases. Um, one of the, the larger, one of the check-ins that we do every year is with the UNC Environmental Finance Center and comparing ourselves to the other large utilities in North Carolina. Um, this is a screenshot of the dashboard um, from the UNC Environmental Finance Center, um, looking at uh, a typical bill of consuming 5,000 gallons per month um, and looking at those larger utilities in North Carolina. And you can see by the, the dials um, to the right that the um, we fare very well in the bill comparison compared to the other neighboring utilities. Um, our conservation signal with our tier rates is um, is reasonably strong. Um, we have a good cost recovery and the median affordability, which is a, probably the most important dial um, on this graph is, uh, which is looking at the annual water and sewer bills as it compares to the medium household income. And according to the UNC Environmental Finance Center, um, you should shoot for having, making 
utilities should shoot for having um, that be less than 2% of the median household income. Um, and that shows that we, we are, we're about 1.4%. However, we also realize that, you know, in Durham, with all the development and certainly the gentrification, that the medium household income is, is going up. So you just can't. Mr. Mr. Greeley, could you speak on just a little more, please? Um, sure. Yeah. In and of itself, you know, looking at that that measure, um, you, you can't do that because the medium household income in Durham is rising. And that doesn't necessarily reflect some of the challenges of our um, tier one and tier two customers. So, but once again, it's still a strong signal at 1.37%. Um, comparing a 4,000 gallon um, per month customer against our larger utilities and what's being proposed by the other utilities across the state, we show we're, we're fair, we fare very well. Um, uh, we don't know the increase in Greensboro, so that's why the Greensboro is not shown on that graph. Um, we are not proposing any changes or increases to the, uh, our capital facility fees for FY23. And with that, I will um, open it up for questions. Um, first off, I'd just like to thank um, some of the staff that has, um, they, and all the hard work that they goes into both this presentation, but also working on the rate model. And that's certainly Vicki Westbrook. Um, one of my assistant directors, Heidi Hackett, and her team, the utility finance manager, Jerry Marone, the engineering manager, who spends a lot of time um, looking at our spending schedules for all of our projects. And also, I want to thank the finance department, uh, uh, um, Tim Four and his team, to help support the, the rate model and, and the utilities functions. So with that, I thank you, and I'll open up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Greeley for your time today and the hard work of your staff. I'll turn it over to uh, any questions my colleagues may have. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Greeley. Uh, Don, good to see you uh, again. Um, firstly, I, I can't speak for the rest of the council, but I would appreciate it in the future if you're not actually going to bring donuts, not to use them in your graphics. <laughs> it's a, you mess with my concentration. <laughs> Uh, but moving forward, let, let me say, um, I, I always appreciate um, this presentation from, from the water department and, and, and look forward to it. Um, one, because it gives us an opportunity to brag on just how great Durham's water is, uh, how clean it is, how good it tastes. It's award-winning, uh, literally uh, award-winning, and, and we appreciate the incredible work. One of the most impressive behind-the-scenes things I've gotten to see since being on the council uh, is visiting our, our wastewater treatment plants and just the incredible amount of technology and that goes into it and, and the, the vigilance and, and diligence and the science. It's, it's just incredibly impressive what it takes to keep our water safe and to keep it tasting so good and smelling so good. So I want to just um, give kudos to you and the entire shop uh, who's up, you know, around the clock uh, when we're sleeping, monitoring our, our water supplies and making sure that when we get up in the morning, turn that tap on, it flows. Um, I also want to want to just celebrate, you know, our continued commitment to delivering high quality water with really, really small incremental increases in our rates as much as possible. And I want to thank uh, you and the shop for honoring that value of ours and our commitment you know, the, the plan, it's mostly water. So the notion of charging people for it is, you know, we understand it's things we got to do to clean it and make it safe, but but I, I, I appreciate our commitment as a city to making it as uh, affordable as possible. Um, and in that, in that vein, what, and you already alluded to the, the, the hardship fund, the, the um, fund, and you, you, you said something about it, it not being exhausted, perhaps because of the other um, opportunities for folk uh, to take advantage of, of getting assistance. Is is the current level of $150,000 in your assessment enough for our needs based upon what you've seen and, and, and trends, or do we need to look at um, muscularizing that some more moving forward? Um, you know, that's something we followed closely this year, um, especially since, you know, we had come to council last year to get increases in, in the fund because we were using 
um, that money up fairly quickly. And you know, really appreciate city council's commitment in increasing the amount of funding in, in the fund. Um, I think at that time when we increased it, there wasn't as the, the support programs that we see now um, weren't all the way in place. And because of these other programs being in place right now, we think the $150,000, if it's carried forward into next fiscal year will be enough. But once again, we'll be monitoring that closely and coming back to you if we think we will be depleting any funds before the year is out. But, you know, as I said, we're, we're projecting to only spend about 110,000 of the 150. Um, cutoffs are less than, you know, 50% of what they were pre-COVID. Um, now we have these other programs in place. So um, we, we really think that where we are now with 150 should put us in a good place for next year, but we certainly will be monitoring that closely and, more, uh, and we'll bring that to certainly manager Page's attention should uh, we see an uptick in that fund. Thank you so much, that's encouraging. And I, I know that that's gratifying for, for all of my colleagues uh, and I to hear uh, that you'll, you'll keep vigilant with that. I, I did wanna ask a question about the, and, and, and I get this question from, from residents and citizens often about the, the kind of what, what undergirds the consistent rate um, increases each year. And is it, is it tied just to the incredible expense of, of capital and the equipment we need, or is, it, or is there some component that's also tied to projections on population growth? And, and let, let, me give you, let me tell you why I say this. There's some years we don't raise taxes, but we still see increased revenues because the tax base has grown. And our rate increase for water it, it seems to be consistent, notwithstanding how many people are paying for water. So is it, is it more tied to the capital needs, the actual equipment uh, needs of, of providing safe water for our city? Or, or is, it, is there ever a year we can not raise it because we've got more people or is, you know, paying for the water like we have with tax rates sometimes? Right, um, you know, it's a good question. Um, I'd love to be able to say yes, um, but, from, from where we're projecting not anytime soon. And, and that's based on a couple of things. Certainly a lot of our infrastructure, our, our linear infrastructure, our water lines and our sewer lines, as I mentioned, are, are over hundred years or mm -hmm. approaching hundred years old. And those lines need to be replaced. Most of those lines are under pavement. Um, so replacing those um, uh, lines are, are very expensive. You know, we currently have completed all the line replacement within the um, Durham town uh, downtown area and Durham Central Park. Uh, we're completing the kind of the initial phase of the American Tobacco um, um, project, project, which is replacing the water lines kind of west of uh, Blackwell. Um, we are in the permitting to start construction on the lines east of Blackwell. Um, we have a large project um, replacing uh, in East Durham and uh, just kicked off a, a project in West Durham and all of the East and West Durham's are areas adjacent to downtown. And all of those projects, you know, you're talking are in the neighborhoods of anywhere to 30 and $40 million mm -hmm. um, for each one. And then as we look at meeting our new regulatory requirements and replace, replacing some of the aging infrastructure that we see, um, the, you know, we're doing a full kind of facelift on the Lake Mickey Dam um, that's you know, over a hundred years old. We're completely replacing all of the pumping, you know, electrical, mechanical equipment within the dam because yeah. um, they've outlived their useful life. So there's all of these ongoing, as we continue to move around the city and replace that old infrastructure, unfortunately those costs continue to go. Um, and then certainly um, adding new um, water supplies to meet our overall long-term needs Mm -hmm. as a community for increased water as, as we see our community grow and develop, you know, it's important to bring the, um, our allocation from Jordan Lake online, which we hope to do in the year 2031 to 2032. And that's a, you know, that's, that's a $500 million project. And we're working closely with our Western intake partners, um, Pittsburgh and um, Chatham County and Owasa to share those costs, but still that's a very expensive project. So when you layer all of that on top of increased operating costs as well, um, it's, it's hard to see that we won't have increases, but once again, we're trying to smooth those increases out and keep them relatively small 
and still meet all of those needs. Yeah, th thanks for that. And that, that that's an excellent primer. And, and I'm glad that, you know, folk watching have an opportunity to hear that just when we turn that tap on, the incredible amount of investment and work that goes into getting that water to us. I, I know kids run up to firefighters and police officers often, but I, I wish they'd run up to water workers as well, uh, you know, recognizing how much you do uh, to serve our city and, and the heroic efforts y'all do to uh, keep our water clean and safe and drinkable. Um, thanks much. I, I look forward to uh, considering the rates in our upcoming budget uh, deliberations. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I yield back. Are there any further questions for Mr. Green? All right, thank you so much. I think at this time we're going to take about a 10 minute uh, break and then we will come back and resume with item 18. I was looking for an opportunity and uh, an old friend of mine suggested that I apply at GoDurham. The community really relies on us, on GoDurham public transportation. Well, I like driving a bus because of the friendly culture. I love it in the morning when people greet me, good morning, they give me a friendly wave, they appreciate you. And that goes a long way being a bus driver in GoDurham. Anything can be achieved here. Um, you can come in at the bottom and you will be able to excel in a fairly short amount of time. Here, I started as an operator and I'm here now as an operator training specialist. So, as long as you stick to it, you can excel. The perfect candidate that would excel at GoDurham is someone with tenacity, someone with drive, someone who wants to make a difference for their community. You have to be people oriented, you have to be experienced, and you have to be on hands, ready to go, but with the proper training, it's just like driving a car. So as a new driver with road training, come in and you see me and I'm gonna make sure you have all the tools to succeed. They give you a lot of input and they work with you step by step. So you won't be alone in this. To anyone considering working for Go Durham, you won't regret it. Please come, please apply. We would love to have you join the Go Durham team. We, the people. Nosotros, the gente. Women, Renmin. Mia Dumavio. Hum Sablog. We, the people, hold these truths. To be self evident that all men and women are created equal and shall be afforded the inalienable right to fair housing. The city of Durham and HUD are committed to ensuring that everyone is treated equitably when searching for a place to call home. There's no place like home. Home is where the heart is. Hey, can I help you? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It is our place of safety and warmth. Home is where love resides, memories are created, and laughter warms the heart. That's why the Durham Human Relations Division is committed to enforcing the Fair Housing Act, which prohibits unlawful discrimination based on race, color, disability, religion, sex, familial status, or national origin.
Every year, 7 million 911 calls are made in North Carolina. 911, what's your emergency? Will you answer the call? Every second counts. You can be that lifeline. People in crisis look to us for assistance. We provide guidance and support until physical help can arrive at the scene. Join us and make a difference in our community. Be the calm in the chaos. Be the voice in the dark. It's the hardest career you'll ever love. Will you answer the call? Discover more at it.nc.gov slash 911 careers.
All right, y'all, we ready to start back. Okay, we're now ready. It is now 3.36, and we are now back in uh, session, but we will, uh, we will continue on with our... Excuse me, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Uh, Madam Ms. Page. Staff. Staff. We're ready to get back. It's time. It is now time. All righty, we will now turn our attention to pooled item 18, street and infrastructure acceptances. Uh, our resource person is Mr. Joyner, and I believe that that was pulled by Councilwoman Freeman. Yes, Madam Mayor. Just, uh, I'm just trying to make sure I'm following where these items are, the selection of these streets are being pulled in from. It was identified through a CIP process, or there were different um, process that that the uh, staff was going. I don't know who I'm talking to, who staff was going through to identify the locations. Uh, this is Robert Joyner from the Public Works Engineering Division. Um, all of these projects are in development currently, and so what these are is these have passed through all the stages of development where they've been. Uh, evaluated, the inspections have been completed, all the punch list items have been completed, and functionally all of the houses in that area have been built. And and so just, and so, just for- future, At the end of that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, just for future reference, is there some place I can look to see what roads are coming online? Um, just acknowledging like God, this is a large number right now, like. Yes, and we will have many more coming that uh, is due what to I, the that nature. That's what my concern is. And so just, yeah, just we, acknowledging, I know we're annexing in the, the county and there are other developments all coming online at the same time. How much of this is going to kind of raise our CIP costs? Like trying to have an evaluation in my mind or a resource to kind of look to, it would be help, it would just be helpful to just no, because I know through our planning and zoning process, there are um, streets that are coming online, but I don't know how to see, I guess, a list of them. Only through this process here for council acceptance, as the streets are completed, um, they're completed on developers timetables. There's no specific timetable uh, that can be looked at or that information is not available. It's, it's as the development com completes each phase of their project and, and on their timelines. And I guess the, the, the kind of wrap around that is, is when we're discussing, I guess, some, some of our stormwater issues or some stormwater concerns, how much, and I guess because there's no timeline or no timetable or it's only on the developer's timetable, how do, how do we kind of plan to address some of the ongoing flooding issues that I'm noticing? I think uh, I shared a video with some staff um, regarding one area of our community. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around how, what, we, what we might be able to do to try and be proactive in addressing some of the kind of runoff issues that have been arising and with all the heavy rains. Um, so I'd have to defer to the stormwater division of the public works department to answer some of those questions, but I, I would note that as a, as a function of development review, a lot of your flooding concerns and things of that nature are looked at as a part of the development review. So you'll see mitigation measures that will start from both the water quality aspect. They will also look through the flooding aspects. And in Durham, you would detain up, you could detain up to the 10 year, which is standard, but in some cases you could detain up to the 100 year storm. And uh, particularly if you're adjacent to existing development that could, that could have improper infrastructure downstream of your new development. 
And I just, just to, and I'm assuming this question is for stormwater. I don't know if we're at the point where we've already made the 100 year stormwater requirement a requirement actually. It, it's a requirement not for all jurisdictions, for not all projects. It's looked at on a case by case basis. Okay, thank you. I will follow up and um, try to get a briefing around it. Thank you. Yeah, and just one other item. If you were looking for a measurement standard, when you approve a zoning, uh, typically when you go through all of the process, the earliest you could expect those streets to come online probably would be five years afterwards. That That'd helps. be a good measuring timeline. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I believe we now return to our last pool item, which was just a presentation, which is a presentation from the stormwater fund and rates. Number 22, mm -hmm. FY 2023 stormwater rates. And Mr. Paul Whipke is our research person. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor O'Neill and Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. I'm Paul Weepke with the Department of Public Works. And uh, I'll share my presentation with you. Um, I'm presenting the uh, stormwater fund and the proposed stormwater rates for FY23. The stormwater fund is an enterprise fund that does have stormwater fees as its primary source of revenue. Our FY23 annual operating budget is approximately $11.7 million, supporting 104 FTEs, or full-time employees. This funds stormwater management, stormwater maintenance, and our street cleaning functions, as well as our capital projects address stormwater infrastructure improvements on, on and within the right of way on city owned property and some on private property. We also address watershed planning efforts to identify projects to perform stormwater retrofit designs and constructions to meet our requirements and obligations with our state rules, primarily uh, Falls Lake and upcoming Jordan Lake rules that were going to be readopted. And we also comply with our upper News River Basin interim alternative implementation approach, which is a, a just an alternative to uh, what this falls like stage one rules were. Um, we'll also begin to address our total maximum daily load. That's what TMDL stands for, our response plans for improving and getting the uh, pollution control under control for our third Fork Creek and Northeast Creek watersheds. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Uh, they are impaired for uh, turbidity or sediment and bacteria. We also uh, have uh, floodplain mitigation projects, which we perform through our FEMA partners, uh, through hazard mitigation grant projects. Most of that is grant funding from the federal government and some through our state partners. And our activities are requirements of our National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit. We have a permit that's reissued every five years. Uh, that we comply with. We're actually responding to an audit right now um, from the state on that. And basically the permit is for developing programs and implementing them that make our waters fishable and swimmable again, because there are impairments. Our key issues for the program, we are seeking a rate increase for the upcoming fiscal year for our ongoing operations. Rate increases are proposed through FY25, supporting our capital spending needs and the aforementioned projects needed to comply with our uh, state rules, Falls Lake, Jordan Lake, and our noose rules, and our, our actual load reduction plans for bacteria and sediment. Uh, we have a bacteria issue in Northeast Creek and sediment is uh, identified in Third Fork Creek, and we've got programs in place and ongoing to address those issues. Um, we have had rate increases in the past, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a future slide. Uh, our capital projects, as you'll see, will peak in FY23. We do have much aging infrastructure, much as you heard in the water and sewer. 
uh, water management presentation. The stormwater infrastructure is quite old within our right of way and city owned property. Uh, as I said before, our Jordan Lake rules and Falls Lake rules are going to be rewritten. And uh, that process is beginning shortly. There have been meetings with Jordan Lake One Water and the Jordan Lake rules and Falls Lake rules. Re-adopt the Falls Lake rules re-adoption process begins a little later in January 2024. Um, and we're continuing our relationship with the Upper Moose River Basin Association. And we appreciate council's support for that effort. This next slide shows our proposed rates for FY22 through FY29. Um, of note on this slide particularly is, is our end balance here. Um, the second line is our end balance at the end of the fiscal year with after operating reserve and operating reserve is important in that you were able to um, secure debt funding, uh, go out for debt should you have a sufficient operating reserve. So the goal with the rate model is to uh, ensure that stays stable and you'll see that FY20 and 2022, the figure is $24.4 million, but it's rather solid. But through some capital funding expenditures, rather, I should say, the, the figure drops to $8.9 million in 2023 and continues to drop somewhat through 2026, but does not go negative or go to zero. So we're in good shape there. The next slide, I'll show you more about our more information on our CIP spend, uh, particularly in FY23. The reason for that large drop was we have a projected spend in FY23 of $21.5 million, which is quite a lot. And nearly half of that is due to, uh, or over half of that is due to our South Elevated Stormwater Rescue. Excuse me, Mr. Wibke, uh, so it's, it's a bit difficult to hear you. Sometimes I'm sorry. I don't know if you can adjust your microphone or maybe speak up. I'm, I'm, it's really important stuff you're going through. So, certainly, let me find that and, and uh, bump that microphone up. I'm sorry that you can't hear me. Oh, no worries. Try Just from time to time, time, you trail off a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, I'll try not to trail off. Um, the uh, the. CIP spending in uh, FY23 is $21.5 million total, and the majority of that is in our South Ellaby Creek project, South Ellaby Stormwater Restoration Project, I should say. Uh, we have a number of our stand, standard items in the uh, CIP, uh, major stormwater infrastructure is, is, uh, is uh, stormwater infrastructure in the right of way. Uh, we have a private property program we fund at about a half a million dollars per year. Watershed planning fluctuates from year to year, depends on when the watershed plan starts. We have a new one starting sometime in FY23, probably the latter part of it for Lick and Briar Creeks. Um, and we have drainage repair of city owned property that's parks, trails, cemeteries, um, basically properties the city owns that's not in the right of way. Uh, floodplain mitigation. Uh, we have a small amount there just due to the fact that most of the funding we have in that program is grant funding. Um, stormwater retrofitting is just that. It's smaller scale retrofits. Um, and we also have an algal flowway or algal turf scrubber project we're, we're working on. And uh, uh, that's a very promising project. And we've got work to do on that. Emergency watershed protection, that's another grant project. Uh, where we get funding from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture as well as the U.S. Department of Agriculture for stream bank stabilization. And we're also through the CIP funding part of the uh, renovation at the Public Works Operations Center from FY23 through FY27 at just over a million dollars per year. And the last line here you see on the, the different projects is our stormwater fleet funding, which is funded there. The, the bottom line, well, not the bottom line is the, the project project totals, but they're inflated. They're this an ad for inflation on the out years, so that's why you'll see a little difference between the the next to last line and the last line. Uh, our, as I said before, our CIP funding in FY23 does peak, and we could not sustain twenty one and a half million dollars for 
each year. So it does drop off to 12 million in 2024 and 10 in 2025, and then fluctuates between 12 and $13 million in some years. And then the out years, it's, it's a little considerably less, but uh, the projects are less well-defined than that far out. This slide shows our customer bill impact for the upcoming year that we're proposing. Residential tier one customers are customers that have residential property, single family home um, on uh, property that has less than 2,000 square feet of impervious cover. Uh, the, the rate would go from 375 per month to 420, an increase monthly of 45 cents or $5.40 per year. Um, tier two residential properties have impervious cover of 2,000 square feet to less than 4,000 square feet of impervious cover, with a rate going from 776 per month to 870 per month, or an increase of 94 cents per month, or $11.28 $11 cents annually. Tier three residential customers have over 4,000 have 4, or more square feet of impervious cover on their property. And their monthly rate would be going from fifteen fifty five per month to seventeen forty two per month, or dollar eighty seven per month increase, or annually at twenty two point four four cents per month, or annually. I'm sorry, I misstated that. Uh, our non residential rates or commercial rates are increasing by ninety four cents for twenty four hundred square feet of impervious cover. And commercial properties are billed according to how many portions of 2,400 square feet they have. It would be multiples of that. If uh, in the FY23, if the rate were to pass, uh, if somebody had 4,800 square feet of impervious cover, their monthly bill would be $17.40. Um, the next slide, I'll show you the our estimated accounts and revenue by tier. We have approximately 6,500 commercial accounts and 77,000 residential accounts. Uh, those you can see on the left are broken out by tier. Uh, tier two is by far the largest number of customers we have on a residential basis at 38,500. Uh, note though is on the right revenue by tier and by, by category. Our non-residential or commercial ratepayers pay 67% or, or approximately $15 million of the $22.4 million estimated revenue for FY23. Residential customers basically pick up about a third of the revenue for the utility through the different tiers that you see on the right-hand side. Our stormwater rates uh, as compared to our communities in the area. Uh, our tier one rates compare very favorably uh, lower, on the lower end of the scale here. Our tier two monthly rates uh, are a little bit higher than the middle. They're close to the middle, but not quite. And our commercial rates are similarly on the higher end of the middle of our rates as a, as, as a comparison. Our rate history from 2010, um, we had rate increases from 2011 through 2015 and then remained steady from 2015 through 2020 and then 2021, we began a series of rate increases. That's somewhat typical of the utility here, at least for stormwater anyway. We go through a series of rate increases and we're projecting rate increases through 2025 and should remain steady once we reach that point. Um, the next slide is um, how we're planning to meet our AIAI or Falls Lake Stage 1 requirements. Um, we're looking at the South LOB wetland to provide us about 21% of our reduction needed there. Our existing projects that we have contribute about 12% over the years that we've accumulated. Stormwater, additional stormwater retrofits will provide about 13%. Green infrastructure is still a rather small part of what we do. Uh, infiltrating water in Durham is rather difficult because uh, the soils in Durham are clay. 
and infiltrating water through that material is extremely difficult. Our innovative technologies for nutrient removal uh, are quite good and have, the testing has borne out well and we, we're going to get significant reductions from that practice. Um, I'll give you a little update on our some of our larger projects, the South Ellaby Stormwater Restoration. Uh, we've begun the soil removal portion of the project, and that should be concluded at some point this summer. And big construction of the final wetland will be late fall, um, possibly early winter of 2022. Um, we also have an algal flowway or algal turf scrubber that we've uh, we're still uh, working on the sites for that. We believe we can find a, a site for a full-scale plant and we're finalizing a communications plan to get word out on that at some point. And I'm available and I'm here for any questions you may have. Let's see. Any questions? Madam Mayor, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Wibke, for uh, this really important uh, presentation. Just on the algae turf scrubber, site suitable for 10, 10 MGD plant identified, what's MGD stand for? Million gallons per day. Got you. All right. And, okay. and, and that's, that's something where you just be, the water would pump out and would be it pulses across a, a flowway that algae would grow on and, and it's returned to the water body um, probably within about 10 or 15 minutes. How, how large a footprint are we talking about for a site for something like this? Um, the actual flowway is 500 feet long by Oh, probably about 500 feet wide for something that's 10 gallons per day, but you'd, you'd need 15 or 20 acres minimum to, to um, work all the grading out. It kind of depends on the, how flat it is. Right. Okay. And, and how the existing property lines intersect with that. Right. Been on the council for a minute. There's never a year that goes by where I do not learn something new about this uh, this whole process of, of stormwater and, and our water in general. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yield back. All right. Thank you, sir, for your presentation today. It's always a learning curve. I can't wait to visit you all to actually see some of the things that you all are doing, and I have some a couple of visits planned. Are there any questions regarding this? Okay. Councilwoman Freeman. Um, just just in, in light of um, the presentation, I just wanted to just ask the question, if if there was a uh, any update on where we are with Duke Diet and Fitness Center, I know that that was a large project that has been moving forward, and I didn't see a timeline, did you say? The, the project is uh, in phase two. They're removing soil from the site. They're doing the grading, uh, the, the preliminary grading, the um, constructed, the actual wetland construction will begin, will go to bid uh, late fall of, of this year, possibly early winter, sometime probably November, maybe possibly December. Um, we're working out some final details on the plans right now. Thank you. Councilwoman McCullough Bayer. Quickly, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, good afternoon. Just wanted to say it's been exciting to see the, the progress at the South Ellerbe Stormwater Restoration. They are doing a lot of digging there. Um, you know, I've lived near there and having seen not a lot happening and then all of a sudden all the soil removal. And so I uh, just wanted to highlight that and um, thank you for the great presentation. Thanks, everybody. I think now we are moving to our, our boards and commissions and our task force.
nomination process, Madam, uh, Madam Clerk? Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to start with the Durham Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission nominations for the category of youth representative between the ages of 15 and 24. Um, there was no confirmed vote on that. So I wanted to ask if um, anyone wanted to change their vote. There, is there anyone who has three, like, what is the breakdown, I guess? James Barnes received three votes, Isabella Miller two, and Camille Sherman one. I think I was Isabella Miller, so that's fine. Okay, to James Barnes. Yeah. All right, thank you. And in the same board for the walking, biking, pedestrian community for marginalized groups, the council nomination is Cesar Castro. Moving on to the Durham Historic Preservation Committee for the category of real estate, agenda, developer and builder is Rakeem U. Chambers. And then finally, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee reappointment is Italo Medallias. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you for that. I believe now we are at the matter of selling our agenda. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Uh, before I start reading um, where, where items will show, I would, uh, the administration is requesting that item number eight be returned to the administration for uh, an additional cycle, um, the technology issues that we had here, um, as well as some additional uh, questions that I'd like to have asked. I have, have verified with the staff that uh, an additional cycle would not impact the service itself. So I am requesting that, uh, and you will note that in my request for settling the agenda. So for consent, I have uh, items one through three, item five, and items nine through 19, GBA, item 20, and GBA public hearings, items 21 and 22. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Is there a motion and a second to settle the agenda? I'll move. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Freeman and seconded by Councilman Williams that we settle our agenda on the set items. All those with sign by saying aye. 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 All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, our, that motion passes unanimously. Now we will return to our city attorney's request uh, for a closed session this afternoon, and we are ready to entertain a motion to hold a closed session. Madam Mayor, I move that we uh, have a closed session. Is there a second? Second. I think we need the language I, I, authorizing the yeah, I need to. I need to oh. get the specific language oh, that's right, because do. there are different types of closed sessions. Uh, this particular one is to hold a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143.318.11A3 for attorney-client consultation concerning the handling or settlement in the cases listed below. Daryl Howard versus City of Durham, 117 CV 477, Middle District of North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Attorney. You're welcome. Moved My red. apologies. <laughs> Move this red. Move this red, second. All right, it has been a motion by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and seconded by Councilman Williams. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor, would you sign by sign, saying aye? Aye. aye? aye. All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously and we will now uh, go into closed session. Don't we go out? Madam Mayor, I'm working on locking down the meeting. Lock it down. Thank you. Okay. I was like, I can't do it. And we'll come back down. Madam Clerk, the city council is going to recess to their conference room for the closed session and then we'll return. Okay. Thank you.